Hey everybody, Ivan Legado here, Maxas commentator at Global Prime Brokerage Fem. Today I'm joined with Francis Hand. Francis Hand is a trader, educator, technician. He runs the site themarketsnapper.com. And I'm also joined by Jeremy Kinslinger. He is the co-founder at Global Prime Brokerage Fem. How are you, gentlemen? Great to be with you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you for uh, you know being so prompt in my proposal to join us today. Francis, there's so much to unpack. As I said, you've been trading the markets for about 30 years. You started trading around the era of uh, the Greenspan era, uh, even though you've always said that the, uh, the Bolker was a much more competent uh, policymaker, I guess. And uh, I suppose that it's only gotten worse from there in terms of you know those at the helm of the central bank. So as I said, there's going to be so much to unpack. I'm really fascinated to have you on board today because you're able to really provide a 360 degree macro wise technical, you are very good at it through your methodology, the, um, the hand volatility funnel. So there's so much, as I said, that we are going to be discussing today. Something else that I wanted to mention is that you're a very strong proponent and advocate of price action being the truest reflection of all it counts for uh, kind of like defining the next direction in the market. And that's why you believe that technical analysis alone, that is going to be the most, I guess, helpful tool to decide what might be the most, uh, you know, um, the most predictable movements into the future. So with that being said, is there anything else or in a nutshell, would you add something else to the intro that I just uh, mentioned? Francis, take it away. Yeah, a couple, I suppose, of foundational points and a, 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 a good research. You're pretty spot on in terms of characterizing um, our focus and uh, how I put forward. First of all, just some really basic principles. Um, I'm no fan of any part of the Fed, but Falker was was semi-serious. Uh, and that was a very interesting era that the handover. And it's actually a cycle that I think has finally turned. So uh, you know, my brother was uh, an actuary and he was net long bonds because he was in a fund his entire career uh, in terms of the interest rate cycles that essentially mm -hmm. the, the peak of Falker into uh, the lows of Greenspan and those that followed him. Um, but yeah, my opinion on the technical analysis is, um, you know, if you're in their fancy club and you were getting the tip off that Nancy Pelosi is getting, you would know it. Uh, so if you haven't received the invite uh, and you're not getting um, the nudges, uh, then you're not in that group. So the only way you get to make the trade is you follow the footsteps in the sand. Uh, and for me, uh, at African, South African, we have a lot of trackers, a lot of guys that hunt, etc. Uh, big open spaces, deserts and stuff. Um, the, the tracks in the sand generally don't lie. Uh, they tell you what animal it is. They tell you what direction it's going. They tell you whether it's wounded, running, etc. Uh, and technical analysis done correctly, and I, I kind of sort of hyperemphasize that because there's an immense amount of dogma and BS. So I spend a lot of my time, in my world opinion, upsetting people um, in what I consider uh, debunking things that are retrospectively irrelevant or eye candy events that only show up when you look back where in actual terms were untradeable. So tradability is actually um, getting in at a, an acceptable time. So it involves entries. Uh, it involves a meaningful stop, which is not a million miles away, so that a reasonable size can be put on with a managed loss. Uh, and managing losses is the game in trading. Um, and also, more importantly, that hyper expansive um, move. So that's why we have a very strong volatility focus. And that's why the method is called the hunt, which is me, the volatility and the funneling thereof. So if you think of your protein shake, which you used to use to drop your <laughs> powder in, um, there's actually the compression implied by that. So we we feel technical analysis mischaracterized a lot of things. It talks about competing trends when you have a symmetrical triangle, for example. You can't be simultaneously two things. You can't be half pregnant. You can't be man or girl, although it seems socially we're being challenged on that one. Um, but uh, so we always say, no, no, it's a, it's a continuation pattern or mm -hmm. it's a potential reversal pattern. You're not in mutual trends. So in other words, what you're getting is a volatility compression. So triangles of volatility compression events in our view. So we reframe a lot of things. We've actually had to write quite a bit of what I would call new technical analysis that essentially is only available at the moment to my premium community because that's how I've chosen to uh, additionally monetize as an additional stream of income. And I'll come back on that on trading as well, mm -hmm. because I actually think most people quit too soon to go full time. 
um, and you're talking to somebody who loved and really wanted to be a trader his whole life and actually probably did it three times before he did it for keeps. Uh, and each time went back to the poor house to start again and work grub stake up and do uh, jobs he was not particularly passionate about. Um, but let's sidebar that for a moment. So yeah, those are core, core principles. And the, if you follow the money, um, you tend to be more accurate. But everyone uses that as a cliche. Nobody knows what does that mean? What do we do? So we've translated that into real action. And actually, that brings us to the concept of sniperdom. I'm far from being a war freak or uh, in any way. So it's the only reason we characterize uh, sniper is in in essence um, they have an incredible amount of efficiency mm -hmm. versus an average infantryman. I tell the tale so I'll, many times, so I'll tell it quickly now. But in World War One, it's guesstimated for the total amount of rounds expended and fired, two hundred and fifty thousand were fired before one person was actually terminated as a result of that activity yeah. given that that's the game let's not get into the morality of it at the moment um, that's highly ineffective uh, in vietnam when you add automatic uh, weapons and uh, jungles that number went between 450 and 500 thousand yeah um, but if you take that usually a special force usually quite high ranking mm -hmm. usually more involved in reconnaissance than actual um, shooting the activity of shooting is rare um, you get uh, a ratio of 1.3 rounds fired for every uh, one actual casualty. Yeah. And when you compare that to someone who's taking 500,000 goes to do something, I'd rather not watch someone try to throw a coin into a, a glass of beer that's going to take 500,000 efforts before he gets it right. Yeah. Um, but the person who is the sniper is using specialist equipment. And one of the reasons he gets those numbers is he rarely shoots. So most of the time is observation. In other words, it's close to, as you can ever be, certainty. Uh, certainty in markets is absolutely fatal. But as close as you can be, always recognizing that a freak event or something it might occur that could spoil the shot. But he's as mm -hmm. close to a certain that he's got a, a, a not just a, a kill shot, but uh, you know, a, right through the middle of the eyes uh, head shot. And that's, that's, that's how you get those kind of numbers. And even still, yeah. it's point 0.3, it's not one is to one. So, uh, but as, a, as an efficiency, that's mm -hmm. extremely, uh, on, extremely on that On that point, you are quoted as, as uh, saying, people trade way too much. Calculate how much you trade per month, divide that by three, and then reduce that by 66%. So essentially that quote uh, sums up what you've been explaining right now in the last Correct. couple of minutes. Correct. Yeah, you're well researched. Um, that is one of the many things that uh, I give away for free just to help people mm -hmm. be better. It's one of a three point bullet YouTube I did um, that's very popular and went semi viral, I think. Um, yeah. And it's just you've got to be forced into a discomfort zone. So people mm -hmm. want to keep doing what they're doing. Um, and you actually have to be find that boredom that sees you do a whole bunch less. And then you have to create that void, that boredom. And then you have to fill it with the right things. What actually is happening is people think trading is the game when in actual fact, selection analysis is the game and order entry is merely like an admin clerk putting the final signature uh, yeah. for the CEO yeah. on your paycheck. And over the years, have you been refining and becoming more patient in the selection of your trades, meaning early doors when you first started your trading career, were you just after the excitement and the amount of activity and over the years you've been reducing that activity? And what has it been like that natural evolution of you as a trader over those 30 years span? I think you get better with age uh, generally. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, highly risk profiled. So, I, and I was uh, quite clearly, um, and I find this with most people when I dispassionately observe, um, we generally all lack a sense of self-awareness mm -hmm. uh, and you become more self-aware as, as you age and you experience certainty only to be proven wrong many, many times over. And you start to realize, hang on, I've got to really grasp this word probability game. You know, this is a probability game. Um, sometimes you'll take two or three uh, selections. So we've got to, we got a live trading day this Friday and I've got four equities in total. And I'm pretty confident that most of them are going to have real blow off events. But it's what's amazing about that is of that four, three might, that would still be amazing if I was lucky enough. And the one I least thought would often be the best one. Um, and the one I thought was best or maybe 
be middling and or or even the one that fails uh something happens so you um it's it, you you continually can be shocked by the market and until you appreciate that um you will not have the money management you require for mm -hmm. that um, I also went and studied with a mental trader coach to understand biological function. Most people are endorphin infused. Mm -hmm. In other words, the, the act of doing nothing means they do not have the excitement or the thrill. They have to be in the game. This is, you know, almost a poker analogy will help with this. They, you know, they're always all in. Um, and of course, being all in means there's nothing on the sidelines to come in when the real chance comes. Um, and you just had to have the adrenaline buzz. So yeah. biologically, people have to become far more conscious and self-aware of um, the grip that trading and the endorsement. It's, it's, it's like the monkey experiments, you know, that you read about uh, where they get random reward. It's called the random reward monkey. You know, if they get a nut every time they do something, there's no real interest. They eat as much as they like. If they never get one, um, they, they stop hitting the button that dispenses. But if you do a real random number, it captivates them. In other words, it's almost like, am I going to have a good day or not? Let's hit the button. Are we getting a nut today or not? Uh, and people, you know, their mood of their day is being determined by the move of the market until you can become dispassionate and mm -hmm. you're actually in a pullback on most of your existing trades and you just see it as a natural course of things and it doesn't lead to a bad day. You're, you're still in development of mastering mindset, which is something we delve in quite extensively as well. Mindset and uh, the great, the, one of the great findings of the person I worked with on mindset is that we continue to think that the, you think of a pyramid and the brain is at the top and it enforces downwards. And I can utterly assert that biology affects mindset to the extent that the brain is um, in reduced capacity. So if you've had four espressos this morning to wake up because you were hitting the tequila slammers last night because an old army buddy was visiting and you've had three hours sleep, um, you can, you can, you know, garner your loins as much as you like, uh, but you've got a lack of glucose in that brain, the quality of your decisions will be uh, far less. And your reaction is you're going to be snatching at a trade long before there's no lack of calmness and there's no mentality. So biology actually is very, very critical. Yeah. So I, I, there's a lot of BS around trading. Then there was, you know, if, if I was in London for an extended period, you know, the notion was that, that there's these flaming Ferrari swigging um, fund managers um, uh, who are chasing strippers and, and all of that. And of course, you would get that crowd, and they were usually brokers um, who were placing the orders uh, and just doing the execute. They could go out and get, because they weren't making trade based decisions. Actually, the fund managers, one of the best, Bolton in the UK, I mean, he's a marathon bi a triathlete. Uh, he's, you know, he's 47, he's married, very ordinary, yeah. very gray, very sober um smart and cares a lot about his physical well-being yeah. um those are those are the profile of people that are pretty stable and consistent day in day out and thinking about the people that found this composure in life and obviously that it leads to better decision making processes and maybe you could think about the way that you teach your own students do you believe that there is a universal way of suppressing adrenaline through meditation through inner discovery or do you believe that each and every single trader have their own journey and from there they can start to uh, you know have realizations about what would be the best course of action so that they can actually keep that down and have a much more you know level-headed uh, approach to the markets what's what's your take in there yeah there's two overlays to the mm -hmm. answer in that one is that yes we are all unique human beings and each person starts with a different uh, personality profile and tendency um, but then there are certain overarching real truths, such as what I mentioned, for example, in the biology, uh, the stimulus of a winning trade or, or a crop of winning trades all going up on that day that sees you FOMO chase a mm. little bit more because you're always too small on your winners and you're always too big on your losers. Um, and, you know, that tendency uh, to, to kick in. So there's, there's overarching principles that hold for everybody. Um, but then there's also a journey. We call it, uh, personally, I, I, I say to our premium clients that they're actually going on a self-development program. Mm -hmm. They go and trade. Yes, we aim to help people build wealth in crazy reset times, 
uh, and we think our method and approach is best uh, and it deals with all things from mindset to selectivity of uh, opportunities and how to manifest them but you are actually going to learn to know yourself and you're going to keep brutally being exposed to yourself where you have, someone is perpetually holding that mirror up to your face and you're having to say own that own that you just did that you own, own that and you and you have to nod and you have to keep owning and then you have to get out of the blueprint ride. So I sometimes talk about, you know, maybe somebody's a mountain bike rider. I've got an e-bike. I'm pedaling around um, bumpy old hills and rounds and enjoy it. Uh, if you were, if you're in a race and you normally take a certain line, often if you've ever seen a motocross track or a bicycle track, you'll often see the popular taken lines. There's almost a groove on the inside track where everyone is is, is hitting it, and then you one day follow a pro. And instead of going on that inside line, he actually holds the old outside line, but does zero braking, leans into you know the berm and just hammers it right the way through and exits on the outside line, but with a lot more pace. And you follow his line just because, and, and, you, and you feel that point of discomfort. You're wanting to lean in and get in the rut that you used to. And then you end up taking the outside line and you come out of the corner a lot quicker and you get to the bottom of the track and you've knocked three seconds off your all time best. Uh, and you think, wow, that's a quantum leap I just did there because, you know, seconds are big. Um, that is a case of traders need to go through that experience. And it's mm -hmm. letting go of comfort behaviors that you have a pattern tendency to consistently repeat. Mm -hmm. And anything that takes you away from that leads to great discomfort. Seek the discomfort. The obstacle is the way. All those concepts are absolutely true. And what we tend to do is even on some of our training, most people um, and this is the psychology of FOMO explained practically. Most people want to remove risk. So they think something may go up. And what they actually do is wait for evidence that it is going up and then chase in, in on that evidence, thinking that they've now eliminated the risk of it could go down or because it's now shown its hand in essence, which is a flawed analogy and is the psychology of FOMO. So inherently they're trying to do that. What they're actually doing is spoiling their risk reward ratio yeah. because the distance from when it's moved. And that's why we always have another catchphrase is, is uh, be early uh, and be right, but have your money management in is um, actually you, you, you want to, you know, dogs chase moving cars. Um, don't be the dog. They get all vexed when they stop. They don't know what to do with them. Know your levels and have the structure. So the whole concept and how we've developed HVF method is I kept seeing highly expansive moves. And I thought I needed to be in there before that. I never felt I wanted to chase it. So this yeah. is sort of Stephen Covey-esque, begin with the end in mind and work backwards. Mm -hmm. And I was asking what actually materially is transpiring prior to the blowout event, because I want to be tight early and with a, sh a short stop. Um, the short stop means you can take a managed loss if you're wrong. And sometimes directionally, it can be 180 degrees, but you don't lose any more money for being 180 degrees wrong. Yeah. You know? So be bloody wrong. Um, be absolutely bloody wrong mm -hmm. if you have to be. Uh, because if you're on the ones that you're right, you're getting a highly expansive move and you aren't waiting for what you see as certainty. And this is why people are often bag holders because no one, nothing really ever goes up in a straight line either. So they're buying relative highs and they're panicking out at relative lows and they're actually getting shaken out. And I've performed that myself. It's a special kind of incompetence, I, I remember calling it. Um, and, and maybe, and I highlight this, it was the pound actually. And there was a big move between 1.75 and 1.9. And I went out, I wanted to be in the trade. It had my whole setup, but I didn't leave the orders in. And I came back and it started moving and I chased in. And then what you then do is because you weren't in with a, in, from the beginning and now you feel you owed that profit. This is the mentality. And you'd said it was going to happen and you talked it up and you never, you didn't put it on. You chase in with extra size mm -hmm. to make up for the fact you're late. And then, of course, because you're now chasing the pump, it has its first pullback. And because you went in too big, it's deeply uncomfortable on that pullback and it goes a little bit further than you expect. You panic sell out of the low and almost certainly it starts running back up again. And I actually repeated, I've done this once before, a special kind of incompetence. Um, three successive events, only to watch this thing go to target and to be going net long and lose money in a long market. Mm -hmm. You can absolutely do that. Um, and as I say, it's a special kind of incompetence and you owe it to yourself to do it at least once uh, so that you can see how you can actually lose money 
uh, being long in a market that goes from 175 to 190. Yep. Uh, and uh, that is because you felt you were owed something and that because you were late. And that's because you got out of shape and out of sync. That means you're ending up buying highs and selling uh, lows. And you've got to stop what you're doing. And that you, you, you were talking about what is the remedy for this. So we have an entire triage process. Um, and there's techniques for becoming uh, more self-aware. So there's such things as having a rear mirror, for example, where you actually see the back of your own head. Physiologically, the stress of a market moving that you're not in shows immediately in your body. So what actually happens is you hunch the lower back, you're more like that, and you're more intent, and you're leaning forward. These are visual cues of self-observance that you can actually detect early. Heart rate goes up, so there's heart rate monitors. Um, I'm actually wearing an aura ring, which uh, measures heart rate variability, which is also the difference between the time in between the beats, uh, which is also for fitness and other things, but it will track if you're getting too more intense. So what you have to recognize is that you're being prompted into flight and fright. Uh, flight or fight. I don't know if that came out right. Uh, and that is the sort of saber tooth tiger at your cave uh, emphasis. Uh, and unfortunately, your body and your physiologically and your glucose can't dis differentiate between um, these concepts, uh, that it's actually not a life or death situation, um, because you are triggering and dumping these endorphins and adrenal uh, events. What tends to happen is you either punch um, or you run. So that means you panic out or you get aggressive and you chase in. And neither of those things, uh, the, the amygdala, which saves your life, it's part of your brain to get you up the tree if you come across the saber-toothed tiger real fast and give you that surge of power and energy, is far faster than rational thought. So every time you enter, you have to have breathed, drop the shoulders. You mentioned meditation. It's a great thing to do at the beginning or an end of the day. And even between the day, those are certainly helpful. And you go into your higher self and say, why are we doing this? And one of the questions I have traders ask always on a setup is how do I be wrong on this view? And it's amazing what an absolute pee on the fire that is. Uh, you probably pee on the barbecue when you ask that question, if you're just about really hot to trot for the trade. Uh, because suddenly now you have to put to yourself a scenario cast where it goes wrong. With HVF method, one of the immediate assumptions is how does this become a, a breakdown instead of a breakup or vice versa? And you draw it. So the actual process of how can this happen and make a plausible case. So you're actually asked to be Hitler's lawyer um, on principle and you go and you make a case. He was deeply misunderstood. Um, people don't realize he wanted the best, you know, go and be the thing you least feel like can happen. And that is incredibly balancing because you're a dopamine affected, you're biologically affected, and you can only see one thing one way. And this is the concept of certainty. And that leads to the FOMO because the move is the confirmation. Uh, so everything is just screaming confirmation. So by going through that process, you suddenly establish uh, a, a cold spot and a hot spot and then you find the middle point and you say okay I've, I've done a reasonable job of actually selling that could actually happen what if someone stands up says something what if that's a mini head and shoulder we're seeing there and we first have a dip down and you calm the hell down and you slow down so we never chase and the one of the second points you mentioned the first point reduce trades by third one of the other points that dovetail because these overlap, our logo is three circles overlapping. So there's a lot of overlap. Mm -hmm. Never enter a market order. So now I force you into mm -hmm. a rational process that is not immediate response because now you have to answer the question, well, at what level am I putting this order? So by giving you more paperwork and admin to do, you can't cash that check so fast and blow it at the casino if it makes sense but that's very important admin it's study and it comes back to the work you do pre-trade hold on a minute we never allowed a market order so even yeah. if and and so many times people think now is the moment and very very rarely is now the moment Correct. especially when people mm -hmm. start dropping time frames the the skittishness you're looking at an amplifier which is even more hypnotic to induce you into action because now you're seeing the regular great point the tick yeah. so you're feeling what well, what well, is feigning the punch is coming you know i need a hook um, and you've got to calm the hell down. Correct. So a lot of our biggest calls and a lot of our biggest trades are macro technical where the money is made in the sitting, not in the order entry. Uh, so we've been talking about the Euro-Swiss franc. Um, I was about to touch on the Euro-Swiss franc. Now yeah. you've been 
summing up the attributes and the characteristics of someone who over time gets to perfect this uh, development process of patience and just waiting on the sidelines until you take the plunge and you make sure that that trait has an edge in your favor in accordance with your methodology. Now, when it comes to the patience that you must have to now put on a short on Euro Swiss franc with an enormous risk reward target, do you have to master any other attributes aside from that patience and all that you've been now explained to us when it comes to uh, you know, the, the preamble or the or on the precursor, precursoring um, time before taking a trade? And when you are in this trade, do you just have to apply the same concepts of patience until it hits your target? Or is there a different angle that you take sitting patiently? So the, the you've got to have a hierarchy of dominance in terms of your decision-making process. What is the fulcrum? What is the, you know, mm -hmm. wood, the timber frame for your house mm -hmm. um, around which you slip in a bit of brickwork here and a little bit of, you know, heat insulation and solar panels and everything, but you've got to have the framework and structure and our framework and structure is the process of HVF method. So the greatest reward is the adherence to process. The damage comes in the tinkering. So for example, in a macro trade, these actually take a while to unfurl. Um, you can be early and people start laughing at you a few weeks later because nothing has happened or it's just, you know, masturbating, as we sometimes call, turning in a range, not doing anything particularly interesting, uh, and it's build up. That's part of the volatility uh, compression. And also, as I say, the adherence, the tendency is to want to do, is to tinker. Um, and most people spoil in the, the doing. So in trading, actually, passivity is, is quite useful once you've got the macro trade. You say, this is our view. That's our level. Mm -hmm. And now we put on, we set the trap and it's a tripwire. And I, you know, I talk about catching bears or whatever the case may be. Well, you do it by the river where the deer go to drink water because mm -hmm. that's where the bears come to do kills. You do it where you can see bear footpaths between two certain trees have continually gone and you set your tripwire there. Um, you don't try to get there as the bears there. You set the trap and then you wait. And sometimes you have to wait a while because, you know, once they've eaten one deer, they might not be hungry for three or four days. Um, and as a result, that's the element of it. If you keep visiting the site and leaving your scent all over the place, um, you're going to invalidate the, the structure. You're going to tinker with it and he's not going to come there anymore because there's activity. There's human activity and he doesn't want that. So you almost have to stand back. You need to be out of it. You are not the game. The market is the game. You don't affect the game. Nothing you do is material. Uh, in any of these major liquid markets of any great note, and you just let the, the news to come to you. So we also talk about HVF method as being the news before the news, because as I say, I, I had the Greek crisis in the end of 2009, uh, before it became the big catchword phrase and the pigs and all of that of 2010. You get the major themes in the same way we had the oil. It was the pandemic. The pandemic, we essentially technically traded the pandemic prior to the pandemic being a thing. Um, and that was calling for single digit oil. Uh, but the macro trade was there. You put it on and you wonder why. And I, I mentioned before to other people when asked about this, um, we had we were short oil, but we were also short a carnival, a cruise liner. And it never made sense to me. We're short pipelines, oil companies. That all made sense. Oil going down, fine, I've got that. But why on an equity that I'm investigating um, am I sure that, uh, sure that? Because one of its big inputs, apart from maybe salaries, I would say probably second on wage bill, mm. would be um, the grease they burn to take pensioners to the Caribbean. Um, and you got your answer. You got your answer later. So don't argue with the charts once you know what you're doing and you have the confidence of an, an analysis. And that's what our service is about. Giving people the degree of confidence that they will stick with their analysis, even where certain things don't make sense, and they will adhere to stop and recognize adherence to process, which includes a stop taken on a managed loss uh, and a, a profit allowed to run and a trade in process for which you are not tinkering. Does it play any role, fundamentals then, or you are just purely 100% based on the technical aspects? And uh, that would be... Trade is always technical for me because the real truth of the money and things are right there in the chart. Mm -hmm. News 
um, I treat news almost uh, counter. Uh, it depends which format we are. If we're talking mm. about financial news, let's keep it trading, I, I suppose. Um, that's usually the confirmation of the target run by the time it's making big, big headlines uh, for us. So we're quite used to nobody being interested in what we're currently doing. And that's the nature of the volatility squeeze and being early. You're interested in stuff that everybody finds boring that was yesterday's news from a long time. And as they start getting back interested in it, you're selling out to them and they're taking over your positions. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the news flow is coming back. Um, and that's being half a cycle early. That's the, the, the big element. You're never first, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we're following footsteps of other people's activity um, and the structure being set up. But you don't need to be, you don't need to be first. You need the, the fat middle of an expansive move. Yeah. So volatility events and uh, crises, seem to, we seem to have no shortage of those. Uh, and it's it truly is great season. It's always been, but I would say in reset times, it's even more than ever uh, the best time to be a reset trader utilizing HVF method with the Hunt Volatility yeah. Funnel. By so. going through a few of your quotes, the one that I mentioned before, reducing the amount of trades that you take per uh, week, per month, always knowing your risk reward before uh, taking a trade and always, uh, you know, placing a stop market orders, uh, not ac acceptable because it is going to make you more reactive. And that is obviously going to trigger that, uh, cocktail within you, that adrenaline cocktail. Also, you mentioned all the work is done in the analysis, all predetermined ahead of the trade, and something else very important, which to me translates and describes uh, accountabilities on your own outcomes. So to me, all these quotes highlight selectiveness, planning and prepping and accountability at the very core. Is there any other fundamental or foundational aspect that you believe would be uh, most uh, instrumental for someone to build and maintain a trading career over time. I mean, we've touched in a lot of things from different perspective and you definitely are a very colorful uh, trader in terms of gi giving the responses. Anything else that you'd like to add on, on top of that? Just on them, I'll go back to half a step to the market order again. Um, in cryptos, for example, you get paid for being in the stack and not throwing market orders in. So Mark, there's so many reasons why you should not ever enter on a market order. And uh, these little nibbles, um, I did, I was trading um, on a spread better platform and I calculated, I downloaded the spreadsheet. So this is what we call PL review and various other concepts that nobody does that they should be doing. And I had um, uh, on that particular year, and that was a sterling spread better. I won't mention the company's name. It's not material to the story. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had uh, 190,000 pounds in trade costs uh, on that account accrued during that year for a retail spread bet account, quite a bit. Um, now, the Turkish lira was, in fairness, one of them and was about 50% of that. It was about 90 grand. Um, so, you know, there was quite a difference in interest rate parity to be trading the try. But even if you just take the remaining trades and you exclude that, um, you you're probably I paid close to a hundred thousand pounds um, on all other markets, um, just on holding cost. So you've got to know to be in a position, even when you are sitting on the hands, there is a cost to you if you're using certain platforms, CFDs, various other aspects. So what you have to be sure of is that the market, what you want is something that's going to uh, perform. And we refer to this as a line of efficiency. So if you're buying long here, you want the steepest line to get to, if your target is over there, to get to that point. We talk about a gradient. So I'm quite geometric, math mathematical family. Um, and so the time in trade, we actually have a RR. T divided by T, we get overperformance to the time allowed. So through the geometry of the pattern, not only do we generate targets, interim targets, where we expect a pause, which allows you to calm the hell down when you get that initial pull pullback, because people spoil trades and they don't yet trust the process. So you sit in and you hold, you bite your bottom lip and you calm, which is saying we expected that. There's, if, this, if you're expecting a bump in the road and you hit the bump in the road, it's fine. It's when you're driving along and not expecting the bump in the road and you hit a bump in the road. And it's a bit bigger than you thought, yeah, and then you swerve and then you roll the car. Um, so that's very, very powerful. And then the time frame, geo 
geometrically generated through the price behavior is also there. And a lot of all our best are performing well sub 50% and even 10% uh, of the time. Because of the volatility expansion, these are usually violent moves. They can be violent. They're not always. They can be steady uh, trenders. Um, and this means we divide by the time that was allowed and the time by which you actually achieved the target. And we get an extra spinner on the risk reward ratio, the key matrix. So this is something that um, I don't know anybody else. This is self-generated. This is HVF method that we do. And so time in trade is very, very valuable. I, was, I got into that because we were talking about markets and the cost on crypto. The other re the reason I was saying markets is this flash boys. I'm a I was very cynical towards the bigger macro institutions. Uh, Michael Lewis, great author. Um, and of course, he had Flash Boys recently. Um, and he was highlighting what somebody else was highlighting. Essentially, they're running in front of you faster. They're getting in front of your order and they will buy it for a couple of ticks cheaper and come and sell it to you. Now, if you essentially say a market order, you're actually saying, I want in. And you're setting no criteria and you're throwing that piece of paper get me in uh, into this box uh, of dark uh, forces that have their own personal money-making interests at heart and don't have yours. And you've essentially given the right for them to write a number in on that. And I've seen some really shoddy fulfillment. Newbies in crypto buying light tokens that hit a market and then you get these crazy wick spikes back down, up and down. This is all because of people using market orders. So you must always set a criteria. You would never buy my house from me and say, I'll buy it, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever your price is. Yeah. You would make me. An I, I wanted to ask Jeremy, Jeremy, have you ever gotten your hands in any research that measures or makes an assessment of the number of market stops versus limit orders by any brokerage firm out there? What's the split? Um, I couldn't say off the top of my head, but I've definitely seen some like that in the past. And I think uh, the sandwiching of orders in crypto definitely happens a lot where you have these bots that basically, you know, you kind of on the blockchain network, you'll flash your order out there. They see that come through. They pay a higher gas fee to execute quicker than you. And that's where you see that really big spike happen. So, I mean, it happens in all markets, but it's really fascinating to see it happen in the, in the crypto markets because you can look at the blockchain and actually see when those orders came through. And some exchanges even show um, a little symbol next to certain orders that, that come through after they've happened. And it has like a little symbol that says this was a bot that basically uh, sandwiched you. And you can get filled in crypto land. Like, you know, if the price is $40, I've seen like up to like $100, for example, where this person has seen your order at $40 and they'll take it all the way up to a hundred bucks. You get filled at a hundred and they get out of the trade and, you know, they've made money before you because they got in first and then you're stuck with that position up the top over there. You get in the, the hundred price and then the price comes all the way back down to, to where you started. So it's pretty, yeah. um, pretty interesting to see. And you've got to have done this yourself um, to really appreciate it. I'm, I went onto a strange platform that was unfamiliar because I was in South Africa and I was wanting to use crypto with a South African bank. And it was unfamiliar to me and I made a, a chronic error and my size was quite large and I spiked a major pair, uh, you know, Ethereum, um, you, uh, Zar, Rand, but because it was a new platform, didn't have much depth, had no dip spec, yeah. had no uh, stack, the offer stack and no bid stack coming up under it. And I moon spiked that and I got absolutely god awful fulfillment. And that was because of inc um, impatience, because I was busy, I didn't uh, just wanted to get it done. I needed to get money in an account, unfamiliar platform, and I hadn't thought about it uh, sufficiently. So everything I'm telling you are errors. It's not because I'm perfect, it's because I've done every single one of them. <laughs> um, and not just once necessarily, but I don't make it, I don't, I've set in disciplines that no longer do that if you every time you're buying in an electronic market there are a lot of people working for their interests uh, if you are not specifying a price the only way to get an actual value is to specify a price hold your breath because if you're fomoing about whether you'll get in or not um, even if i say people have wanted market i still tell them to put a limit very close then to the bid the top bid um, mm -hmm. Just because, A, it saves you money on in crypto instances per se, but also you can't break the habit. It's just got to be something you don't do. It's kind of like you don't drink a bottle of scotch before you go uh, taking the family uh, on a car trip somewhere long distance. You don't do that. It's the equivalent of that. It's like offering to buy my house uh, and not saying a value and I'll just write in on your checkbook whatever I want. Um, it's that bad. That's how you have to view it.
So, sorry, I revisited that point. Yeah. But your other point is was, was, was a question around fundamentals. So uh, let me address that too. So I do love fundamentals and I like to run uh, ride things and I love understanding the overall mechanization of the economy. And I also have a skeptic's view of everything I read and tell. I look more at what actually happens and manifests and draw conclusions from relationships that I observe rather than that which I'm told. Uh, I mean, I'll just tell you a funny story. Uh, this is a little bit reset. I might have said to some people, but uh, Elon Musk, um, I, I don't know quite what to think of him. I'm a South African. I'd love to him to be the best entrepreneur in the world and all of that. But the, uh, the, a CEO who's running Neuralink, running, building, um, we meant, this is what you're meant to believe, building an, under, an LA subway, running a car, major car company on Twitter all the time, also talking to doggy developers and memes. Uh, I, I think he's just a front man. I think he's the front man for the, the Rockefeller EV transport company, let's just say, for example. Um, we recently saw, I was short junk. Uh, I, I keep mentioning this trade. It's the trade I feel I should have been paid on that I wasn't. I, I accept that 100%. It's a joke for me, by the way. I was short uh, high yield uh, going into um, the pandemic. Uh, great inverted structure. Uh, and then the Fed came in and stood behind it. Uh, and actually it was capitulating. It was absolutely falling. I had huge puts, it was going great. Uh, and then they said, no, we're all back uh, high yield. And I think they had to do that because pension schemes would fall because if uh, the junk market started to fall, there were a lot of debt that was on the level, which isn't being rated correctly by the agencies. That's one level above uh, junk. You would have had all sorts of pensions fall out of bed. They're not ready to let the whole wigwam fall over yet. Uh, but they are managing that process and we've got all sorts of unsustainable events that will lead to that. So the reason I mentioned that is Hertz was a car company that essentially had to go to chapter 13. And they on their own had a huge, on this same uh, ETF of high yield, had a huge wall of debt that they clearly couldn't pay. And in fact, they'd even taken new debt in the December that they'd failed to make the first payment on in March. Which uh, So there was a window and then it started. So, I mean, that's, you know, when the company's that bad, listen, I've run companies. I know what it means to me to payroll. When it's that bad that you can't even pay your debt and you have to fess up to that, that is one buggered company. Went into chapter 11. Next thing you know, it comes out supposedly four months ago and they're now spending 4.2 billion supposedly on uh, Elon, 100,000 of uh, Elon's cars. Uh, so I just look at junk and I say, well, the Fed backed it, so it didn't go down. The Fed, so Hertz is just the government's uh, rental car company as well. So you've got the government's future EV car company doing a deal. So it's left hand to right hand, you know, this offer of a deal. And then you find out on Twitter that there was no contract yet in place. He was forward selling. This is about the umpteenth time Elon, Elon Musk's company or he himself has spoken of something um, uh, prior to it actually happening. So they're still negotiating. It's still yet to happen. Yet Tesla's uh, market cap gained uh, 200 plus billion. Uh, and they're now a 1.2 trillion company. And I remember when it was a big deal when Amazon, Apple, which are much longer in duration companies, were that. So I, I have a cynic's view. Some people say, man, you're a tin pot, you're a conspiracy theorist or whatever. But if government standing behind both, essentially these companies, through the Fed, through the various systems, this is one hand offering to do business with the other. It's kind right. of like I'll... I say to Francis, I'm going to lend him a million dollars and this, this hand says it's going to spend a million dollars. Actually, it's a zero it's a zero cost item to me because I'm passing money from myself to myself. So I do have the cynics view uh, fundamentally of some of what's going on. I think it's become a bit of a circus, really. It's a complete circus. Um, that said, uh, I feel the dollar milkshake theory will provide. I think we fail on dollar strength for those that are currency interested. I think there's a guy called Brent Johnson who talks about the dollar milkshake, and uh, I think he's correct. And so we invite you to share your charts anytime. You just got to press yes, the button. So and maybe we do you, that. You I mean, I'll just show you a couple yeah. of very successful structures. And, and, I'm, and I'm glad that we can actually segue into fundamentals because I truly believe that this is the most fascinating macro, uh, macro juncture that we find ourselves in many decades just because of oh, yeah. what's been happening. So if you could just present to us your macro thesis heading into end of the year 2022 and beyond, that would be uh, incredible in terms of the insights that people would be able to to capture out of it sure 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 so um let's talk about the big currencies a little bit because that's big flows between alleged independent nation states mm. um so the dollar index 
for example, um, we've had this view that this is a macro continuation pattern. Uh, you, it's go so we and again time frames. So I will always say when people are uncertain of where we are, go to the big time frame. Stand on the mountain. You've got to establish what continent you're in first before you go. I'm in my deck chair in the back garden of 38 Little Hampton Street. You know you've got to first where are you nation state wise. So go to the tall mountains. That's what leadership is. That's where smart people start. Macro. So it's always a macro down to micro. This is in essence the euro versus the dollar in essence because the dollar index a lot of euro. There's of course there's pound a bit of yen. But uh, the dollar index is this. This has been a falling wedge with re relative crises that have transpired. We call this squeeze over here. I'm going to just put a blue color because I've got a lot of pink already on there. We call this squeeze as a resurgence for dollar strength. And this was one of the most single-minded, real, non-stop up trade errors for dollar strength. You went straight up like that. These are very powerful places to belong the dollar. Now, understanding that if you're a crypto trader is very important because many crypto guys forget that there's two halves to BTC USD. There you go. Um, and mm -hmm. that the dollar strength, if dollar's getting backed, um, dollar's king fiat. So we talk about God markets in the fiat market. Uh, and if the fiat market, the main one, the tallest tower, and I talk about the circle, the village, with the tallest tower being the dollar in the middle. And there's a little bit of a rivalry with uh, the euro, but the euro is the sort of second, uh, the second uh, king there, but a lesser one. Um, so they tend to have what I call a seesaw relationship. Very good for dollar, usually means poor for euro. So big multinationals that run treasury departments, if they feel there's going to be dollar strength, they're going to lighten up their euro holdings and hold more dollars. Uh, if they think there's going to be dollar weakness, they'll move into the euro. So they need the, that four trillion odd liquidity as their seesaw. It's not gambling, um, but it's sound treasury decisions, for example. But that was a very single-minded, strong period. Now we've got to determine what's happening here. Well, for us, uh, I think this wedge is done on the log scale. So I might have to just change the scaling a little bit. There you go. Uh, but for us, you've broken a falling wedge. So this is where macro technical people say, oh, technicals. Oh, it's, there's so much dogma and rut, bad cliches. Uh, charts are for timing. Nonsense. Just look at a bigger chart. So, you know, everyone thinks you do the fundamentals and then you just choose that second or that minute in the day or that hour or which day to do the trade. Just look at much bigger top charts if you want to understand the flow of the market. So this is a falling wedge break for which you've got a continuation pattern staying with the color blue um, that has been setting up like that. And uh, for us, uh, we think this comes up and actually you're going to resolve in strength, which goes very contrary to sort of the Peter Schiff narrative of, um, the dollar going to zero. I say going to zero against what? In it, remember, we're talking fiat to fiat now, not fiat to gold, fiat to everything else. And I talk about the key flippening moment when dollar is both going up and the anti-fiat such as, and I call them the category of anti-fiats, it's a self-derived uh, category, but that includes Bitcoin, uh, other cryptos potentially that are uh, serious projects and uh, gold, silver, uh, and commodity complexes as well. So that flippening moment is going to be the big problem. That's when you know the reset is on, the real, the final stage of reset. We are already in it, and it's already happening. But the actual capitulation moment um, is when gold, silver, Bitcoin are all going up on a on a very strong dollar, um, and that's a key moment where the final shoe is essentially dropping. And I warn people that that will come. Um, but until then, you're still in the reset, but you're in the, the, the stages of that. So for us, this resolves to the upside, and we have targets for that. That's bad news for the euro, and we just called the euro Swiss francs short uh, for a second, uh, third time, apologies. Uh, we called the floor break and the 2009. Interestingly, all end of the year, by the way, and I can transition what seeing as I brought that topic up to the, uh, those charts, uh, all at the end of the year, going into the beginning of a new year. So the floor fail was January 11. Uh, I was on a Cantos charts in uh, the UK, and I was talking about it in, into that year end prior to it happening, that they would walk. Um, and I went away on holiday to South Africa, to Cape Town, no less, in 2009 for the Christmas New Year period. And I put on a pending order short, as I've described, using HVF method on the Euro Swiss franc in 2009. So the end of year going into the new year events, typically, uh, and they're all six years apart. So you have the 666. I love a bit of that. That keeps uh, the numerological people happy. 
Um, but yeah, so it's 2009, 2015, 2021. So I am calling a triple six on the Euro Swiss franc um, in essence for a fall to the downside. It certainly um, looks like a pretty scary a target for those that are long. Uh, indeed, indeed. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause, just think of the headlines that have to come. So America has been hit a lot with the inflationary headlines. Um, but this is going to get passed to Euroland now um, because they are, uh, whenever the currency weakens, so proliferation uh, or weakness of currency is inflation because everything important, imported obviously costs more. Um, and so it's going to be a very nasty inflation narrative for um, the Europeans. And here were those uh, previous two events that I've alluded to, again in the blue, the 1.5 fail that literally went just to parity, just avoided making parity when mm -hmm. it was finally defended. They then did the 1.2 uh, floor, which again, year end, you can see its cusp of 2015 break in 15 January uh, into that uh, sell-off. Now that that took about, uh, wow, the, the amounts that were lost, by Alpari went underground, uh, they were crushed. Uh, FXCM had to recapitalize because everybody was taking the free trade. And I keep saying there's no such thing as a free trade and the central bank is not your friend. He's absolutely not your friend. He doesn't work for you. He works for the people who put him in power. Um, and you think it's you. So the game is, here's what we're doing for the people. And then there's what they do for themselves. And I'd rather receive the biscuits they're giving themselves than the doggy biscuit they're handing you. But nonetheless, so no, I just quickly, there was there was also no... Um... There was no warning that they were going to remove the peg, and if anything, I think um, just before Did they I? said that they said they were actually yeah. going to hold it. So, correct, absolutely good point, Jeremy. Um, the uh, the actual head at the time in December was asked because Draghi was saying he'll do whatever it takes on the euro side. So they were really caught. They were really really caught squeezed, and he said, "No, it's essential to our policy. The peg is central to our policy." Within two and a half weeks, they'd run. They just stopped putting a bid in, it. and the market tested, 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 realized there's nothing thing there and the floor disappeared and in fact the liquidity providers were not giving a bid many of them were not giving a bid people couldn't couldn't execute now imagine being the only buyer on your target down there you can you can see a big uh, a big big run on the parity the parity level is this blue line there on one and so for me people will start paying attention when parity is run but it i think it will get disorderly into that and that's going to be german swiss uh, my apologies, French, Italians moving money into uh, Swiss banks again, I think. There'll be, who knows what the headline will be. This is why I find it fascinating. You mentioned the fundamentals. I love the story. We all love the story. It's harder to just trade a chart without knowing what you're doing. But it's got to come first. Now wait for the story. Guess, have fun. You, uh, in many instances, you'll be right. Look, they've got the banking stories they can reheat. They might, they might uh, you know, supposedly Italy was the source of the last, uh, the main you know, uh, pandemic uh, results because of the clothing industry traveling to China. That was a narrative. As I say, I'll just leave it there as a narrative. People can decide how much they buy of that um, for themselves. Uh, maybe they'll do another another pandemic. It seems that we're very well set up. I don't know. We can only speculate what will, what will uh, do that. But it was very similar for oil. Uh, just put the trade on and see what uh, happens. So, in, in terms of forex market, obviously we've been in the last few years uh, more than we wish uh, accustomed to a low volatility regime, and that is obviously because in central bank uh, terms we are in a race to the bottom, and the uh, tools have been exhausted, and everybody wants to obviously keep the rates very low so that they actually can have a bit of a you know everybody's fighting for that competitive uh, exchange rate advantage so that they remain competitive in their own countries and selling goods and services. Do you think that we might be potentially transitioning into an environment where we would start to see more uh, rate differential? Uh, among different economies. We've seen uh, bond yields mayhem last week, uh, Australian short-term bond yields going like, ballooning yeah. and, uh, you know, front-running the, the, uh, the long end of the curve. And uh, so what, what's your take in that? Do you think that that's going to take us into a higher volatility regime in the Forex market as well, heading into 2022? It's a very good question. And you're right to bring all of these things in because they all work together. This is the great macro understanding of the great machine. We're yeah. also known for calling the end of the bond bull market. Mm -hmm. um, and we said that the pandemic event was the final capitulation in a net long bond bull market. Mm. And this 
dovetails a little bit with overlap like everything because it's a functioning machine with the currency. So if I'm showing you the charts here, um, this was the Falker era going into uh, the high spike of interest rates. This is a 10 year treasury yield. And that was the super bowl. You were right up there. That high was around 16. Uh, and then down, 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 you, you came. And this is, this is the story of our history in bonds. Now I've changed it from to logarithmic so that you can see the relative percentage differences. And you can actually normally get high volatility near ends of trends. You get a final blow off in bull markets and you get a capitulation in bears before you move in the opposite direction. I call this in its HVF lexicon, I call this bookending, um, the, vol the volatility of bookends where you essentially have your whole encyclopedia set. That's the beginning, that's one, and that is omega, that is the end. Uh, blow off and capitulation of trend. And this is in essence what you had. You had huge volatility in what was a broadening structure up there. You had your top in rates and then you were staircasing down, down, down. Each of these red lines broken to the downside. Bonds was the trade. Um, being long bonds was absolutely the trade. Now look at the scale of this capitulation when you log scale in difference because you went from 3.2 to sub 0.4. 0.39. That is absolutely huge. And that is a final route. I think the whole negative rates, as long as there's cash in the system, is a bit of a is a bit of a wild card to keep people off thinking that it's the end for the bond market. It's exceedingly difficult for them to uh, introduce uh, negative rates while there's still cash. That said, they're out for cash and they want to kill it. And central bank digital currencies that I think is almost assured to come. They've told you that they're setting them. We've we predicted this for a long time. Now it's fact. Um, they will probably have exploding ones, use it or lose it. They will taper in value and all sorts of uh, techniques so that they can control expenditure. That's what's coming. I think to everybody, use as much cash and try to keep it in the system game as long as possible. Um, but I don't think we will stop the tide uh, of where these folk are taking us. So we're actually a long run um, uh we see the yields climbing. But the problem they have is they can't climb too far too fast because instant reset because of the debt. So this is all going to force a particular circumstance. And if I bring up the actual value of the bond chart, we have a massive head and shoulders. So where we differed from Raul uh, a year ago um, and the guys at Real Vision is that we were saying actually he, he liked at one point, this uh, setup over here, it was some time ago, it was still around about April, May, post the events. He liked that setup over there for long side. And we, we were saying, no, we think that's an exhaustion. Because again, you get final blow off, major smackdown, and then this buy the dip, late bulls rally. This is very skittish uh, conduct. And we said, this is going to come roll over. And it did. We're actually in an inverted HVF there. Uh, don't let me, I won't get into explaining all of that, but without saying too much, we expected that to come off. And we, the interesting and valuable part of this chart, if I pull it through so that you can see more of it, is that it came all the way down to a similar area where it found support at the 135 level when you were in this falling wedge that was a rest point for making this as a head. So actually our supposition is there is scope for the debt markets to be in a major head and shoulders here. Uh, yeah. the ETF. Personally, I think there's too much debt. So fundamentally, it makes absolute sense. Uh, and you'll probably get issued some relatively worthless token that will then crash. Um, this technique's been used before. So when they write off debt, it will it will be, they won't write it off and admit that they're writing it off. They'll give pension funds some other asset, which will be some central bank digital token. Yeah. And then that market will largely be unsupported, allowed to crash, and then they can buy their debt back uh, so, that they owe really yeah. cheap. So are you of um, the view that inflation is going to be coming, coming back with a vengeance? And if so, because it looks like that's what the chart is uh, representing or telling us, do you think that there's going to be any resemblance to the 1940s uh, financial repression where we may end up with high inflation and low rates, meaning that uh, whoever holds cash is going to be killed through stagflation. What, what's your view there? Uh, I don't think you, people are very associative in thinking. So they always go, must be like something else. Right. This is going to be like nothing else, in my opinion, mm -hmm. although it will have features of previous events in it, but it's going to be entirely unique. You're talking about 
economic case history that is a global collapse of an entire system uh, an old donkey's falling over and you're going to be propped up on a new a horse uh, who might not like you might want to throw you off but that's what's happening and just regarding deflation inflation i like to give this analogy um, in fact i was giving it to uh, my premium community essentially uh, i'm in the middle of my garden and i've got my four-year-old son pulling on my one hand wanting me to play with me and I've got my five-year-old daughter of equivalent strength tugging on my other arm and we're playing and they're hanging off my arms and it's all good fun and broadly you could argue for the forces that were applied which were not very strong uh, I was in a state of balance we're in an uneasy state of balance where instead of my four-year-old son we've got a combined harvester with a thousand five hundred newton meter torque that have grabbed both my arms and then you've got a, a, a tractor uh, for pulling a plow uh, with a, another 1500 newton meters of torque that's got both of my ankles and both are pulling exceedingly hard now now for the 30 seconds that my limbs remain in the sockets you can argue we're in balance again because the power of the two vehicles are um, uh, similar but uh, you wouldn't say it's a very uh, safe system. So what we essentially have, and I'll even use a climatic topical thing, is you kind of have an exceedingly inflationary conduct from the, the central banks, which is there. The forces happen. Printing money is inflationary. It's not price rises. Prices rises is a symptom. Printing money is inflation. And it's also the worst taxation on the poor, but taxation on everyone. Um, it's the least of a taxation on the wealthy, but I'll just slip that in. But that's what they're doing. So they know they're killing the Gini curve. They know they're impoverishing um, the poor. They know they're hollowing out the middle class and they know they're enriching the asset rich class, the billionaires. So don't listen to this morality. Oh, yes, we'll do some UBI. We want to help. That's just to ensure self reliance on state and serfdom and entrenching their role, uh, UBI. That's it, you know, as the dispensers of gifts. And of course, they'll have conditions, which I'm sure will have something to do with your nth booster and various other conditions that right. you're going to have to comply mm -hmm. with. But parking that point up, they've created a super amount of inflation. But the reason it hasn't been felt until recently, because now everyone is like in the inflationary camp, we were correctly, as you said, in the inflation camp when Raul was suggesting bonds would go up still. Um, and now that it's being uh, recognized is because they are smart and they understand as they create an immense amount of inflation, they also have a diametrically opposing heavily deflationary created event, in my opinion. Um, it's kind of convenient. And that was the, pan the pandemic. Essentially, you stop people from traveling, you force restaurants to close, um, you put uh, all sorts of criteria on freedom of movement, people drive less, people do this. All of these things have happened. So you, at the same time as you've created the splurge of definitely inflationary behavior, you create this, you do real demand reduction. So it's amazing that we've only got this much inflation and still it's out of hand. Then you go to shadow stats, someone like John Williams, and you realize the true inflation rate is double digits um, in, in America um, and yields should be extensively higher. And they're absolutely trying to devalue the debt by paying a ridiculous coupon rate. So bonds are the worst trade. And this is what we've been saying. And the chance of being brought to zero by a sleight of hand, as I've already suggested, issuing some worthless central bank digital token, allowing it to crash, buying it back later once everyone's given up on it. Uh, any, some form of what I would call orchestrated governmental financial fraud of some form, which allows them to technically make the book whole and they'll be buying it back up when they allow the token to come back. But they'll do some form of debt jubilee by a sleight mm -hmm. of hand, in my uh, view. So you actually have... The, the, the guy who did global dimming and 9-11 happened and there were no planes in the air. The temperature went statistically higher, he claimed, uh, 1.5. And that was proven because there was no hair. Uh, so what he was saying is, so that proves that there's global dimming because you are getting hotter on the sun, for example, but by throwing more carbon off, we're actually knocking it out. So you can get super hot on the sun and throw a god awful amount of pollutants in there. You wouldn't say again that that's a very good situation to be. I'm not uh, got a view on the climate change that I'm trying to put. I'm just saying countervailing forces. That was a scientific situation. So all we've done is we've put in two massive countervailing forces, but even still the inflationary one is beyond. Because now demand is slowly coming back. Uh, 
it was quite funny. Someone asked a question about inflation and not just cost of energies. He asked about rents in America of Biden. And he just said, uh, he just lied in my opinion, or is not smart enough to know. We don't know which one it is, uh, but it said it caused COVID and supply chain issues. Um, no, it's not. It's caused $7 trillion created. It's caused 25% more currency in a single year than all you've ever created in your entire history before. That's called inflation. So infl America's kind of already done that now. A lot of those dollars were also needed offshore. This is, comes into the dollar milkshake theory because actually demand for dollars for people paying, buying oil, and as that demand comes back, goes up. This is the Triffin's dilemma. When you are the, the, na the nature of the, the primary currency holder of the world, you have to run deficits and export dollars because everybody's paying in dollars to buy their stuff. That's why dollar goes up in a collapse. That's why we reset on collapse. And we have technical structures. We've spoken about this before, the USD Korean won, beautiful. We're along the USD JPY. We're looking at 136. Um, so the Far Eastern currencies, not just Eurozone that I'm thinking are going down. And of course, we were, we've had the Turkish Lira as a favorite. We've had about seven HVFs in a row that we've traded net long. It's getting a bit expensive now with the rates, you have to watch it. But uh, so we're already slowly seeing the FX emergings um, in huge trouble. Just look at an Indian rupee chart. Just look at a Brazilian real chart. Just look at the Turkish lira chart. So actually, we slow motion in reset. I'm here like, wake up, wake up. The Titanic's already got the hole. The water's mm -hmm. already coming into the hole. Um, the band's still playing, but don't keep dancing. Jump in a boat uh, and put a life jacket on. Uh, and so is your, it's going to be your life, life jacket. One of your life jackets is going to be the digital space, embracing it and getting into traits uh, that are going to represent escape from the old system into the new system, such as Bitcoin, the theorems of the world. Uh, Raul Powell has been quoted as saying, this is the fastest pace of technological adoption the world will ever go through. And now just this week, we had Facebook renaming itself to Meta. We got genetic science, uh, science artificial intelligence, the distribution data, 3D printing, you name it, 5G, 6G. Like, what's the end game when you start to think about the old guard losing control and then there is this new technology that is coming and roaring ahead and now we've got the approvals of the ETF for Bitcoin, the mini contracts for ETH and so that acceptance and validation is there. And Raul Pal says uh, cryptos is macro. Like, for someone who's been trading for 30 plus years and saying, Forget about everything else. Crypto is macro. What's your take in this whole notion that uh, this juncture is just... Yeah, Raul does awesome stuff and he's right about the exponential age. Where I diverge is mm -hmm. the notion that this isn't captured. No, so my key rules, I have a couple of Francis Hunt rules that I'd give people. These are like 10 commandments. I'll give you one. They, and you can fill in whoever they is uh, for your liking, will never let you have your own money. They must control the issuance of money. The absolute law of power is the, the control over the issuance of money until people truly actually get that. So when you say escape, you're escaping nothing. You're going from the same people's old game into right. the same people's newly created room mm -hmm. for you to run into in the new game. Um, so it, those that are espousing a libertarian, I find people that are Bitcoin maximalists, I was talking to him once in the interview, and he says it's the only true thing that's freedom and everything. Bitcoin, there was 1996 uh, NSA paper that was describing something very, very similar to Bitcoin. Um, I talk about fairy tales too. So when, we, when you want to control people, the best thing especially when you're a small number of people and you want to control a large number of people. You have to have absolute power, you have to have force, you have to have a lot of means, but one of the most useful things is an asymmetry on information and what is true. Um, and you want to have and you want to withhold. The more you keep people believing um, fairy tales, the happier they are. So there's a, there's a guy with a Japanese name called Satoshi Nakamoto who went and did all this work, was communicating with someone, not an intelligence agent or uh, person, um, created this whole new currency system and then quietly disappeared into the ether that no one can track, no one can find, never collected his Nobel Peace Prize that he should get, his uh, financial prize, um, doesn't move any of that money, doesn't has no need for it in that wallet, uh, sits with all the Genesis coins and goes. That's Santa Claus for adults. 
that's too fairy for adult story to me. I just don't conceptually uh, believe that. They've cultivated that narrative to explain away a few things because everyone asks who made God, but then you note it no longer is a big part of the lexicon. Just deal with it. It's your freedom. Just take it from me. Carry on. You know, Bitcoin and crypto is your freedom. So when you want to create a new financial system, the, your biggest problems are the libertarians and the people who know all your sins. So the first system you have to do is to create something that wins over the most hardened skeptics, then everyone else follows. So what do you do? You tell them your freedom lies here and you convince them that it believes it and you create a construct and a narrative that fits that. And as a result, everybody thinks they're escaping government. Only the blockchain and Bitcoin is open source banking and you can check any transaction and any idea. Uh, and unless you're in a, a very powerful secrecy coin, um, anybody can see how much money I've received in a particular wallet address. Sorry, that just doesn't stack. None of that just stacks. You're now, you're now blogging your online banking. Um, that's the fact of blockchain. Um, so the facts, the hard hitting facts, Sorry if I'm cynical, if I'm the, I'd rather know truth, I can handle the truth. Many people can't and they hate you. They hate you for bringing a nightmare onto their thing. Get over your, 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 you know, your Stockholm syndrome. Get over your, your depression about realizing that if you were ruling the world, you would want, you would be certainly when you move people from one room to another uh, that's closer to the abattoir, um, you would make sure that they, it's all for the best. It's all for the best. You're escaping these bad guys and you'd control the villains and you'd control the good guys and you'd be controlling narratives. Absolutely, you would if you were in that place. The biggest conspiracy is to think that in uh, absolute power situation, people wouldn't seek to control the masses. That is the real conspiracy. It's absolute control. And that's why I talk about control structures. Crypto is not your freedom. Crypto is your new financial system replacing your previous one as set and designed by minds, technology. They're in two technology life cycles ahead of what you know is in existence. Um, so, you know, I don't even think a secrecy coin will be strong enough uh, to survive. I think I'll just put a red tag on you. But, you know, in, if I had to do one transaction, it was my last flight out of a place where my life might go really rotten and I was going to some Lieber land, little island, um, maybe I'd use it once um, just to get out. Yeah. So that, that, that's my, you know, it's a, it's a bucket of cold water, but mm -hmm. nothing I hear makes any sense apart from that. It's not what they say, it's what you see happening. Mm -hmm. They have absolutely could have killed Bitcoin long ago. Now they're doing ETFs, basically stuffed with derivatives, by the way, which is a great way to control uh, a big market on a uh, small market, stuffed with derivatives. they all of this. They could have killed it long ago. They were trying to manage the price by saying, oh, it's, you know, it's the pedophile's currency. It's the AK-47 yep. buyer's currency. All of that nonsense. Cash is that. Cash is that. And the HSBC banking system was, was washing the Mexican cartel's money. It's everything they do that they project on you. Yep. So that's narrative and it's all deception. Yeah. So let's I have, talk a, I have a question, if you don't mind. Do you think that whoever created Bitcoin, um, and if it was a big grand plan, you know, two steps ahead, that they would have had the, the foresight and understanding or even they planned themselves to create all these different DeFi protocols that are coming out that, you know, completely shake up the finance industry? There's organic growth that happens. No one can plan micro detail of everything and how every individual will react. Although you'll be amazed how with... Um, our, our reliance on internet, how much you can be stimulated and made to do. But let's park that for a minute. No, so it's not like it's detailed right to the bottom sense, but you reach a certain size. If I was a billionaire, I would get an invitation to a party where someone would set me straight and tell me which political party I'm now going to fund, without a doubt. Um, when you get to a certain scale. So, you know, maybe say, for example, Charles Hodgkinson of ADA, for example, started doing it. He had this idea, he left Ethereum. Ethereum is totally captured, for example. They're going to be working with a Chicago professor to list all property. It's one of their goals. And the, this professor's goal is that you declare a price and value for your assets. And every uh, year, if they think you've under-declared it, you can be forced into a sale. 
This is about getting people off the land. This is about rental extraction, owning nothing and being happy. The World Economic Forum has told you. So there's too many coincidences in there. So if you look at uh, going back to the Cardano, they're all going to comply with various um, uh, big state things. If you want your project to be a success, you have to comply and you have to plug into the matrix. So eventually you become a, a weapon or part of the system of the matrix. Same as Google is censoring news that they don't like um, and striking YouTube channels where they don't have popular opinions. You get to a certain, you actually become part of the dark state by default, if, uh, no matter whether you're a publisher or in, in a news uh, system. So we are in a captured, we are in a total captured environment. That is talking my about, uh, opinion. Talking about capture environment, uh, now we're starting to hear the, I guess, the wrong type of noises uh, surrounding stable coins because some of the stable coins are obviously at the epicenter facilitating trades in the crypto yeah. arena. Uh, do you think that stable coins, for the most part, are either going to be doomed or be part of the system? And based on the plans that the, the, the ones in power have with the CBDC, uh, my, I guess, prediction being cynic is, or not so much, is that they're going to force the removal of these stable coins. And we're starting to hear the president's working group in the U.S. Uh, wanting to enforce some, I guess, dramatic actions over time. What's, what's your take there? I don't think there'll be a job lot instant removal because it'll right. be a problem for crypto. Actually, crypto yeah. absolutely needs, in a bearish environment, you need a stable coin. What they'll do is regulate it into out of existence. In other words, they, everything is KYC'd. So you, you also heard that Yellen was talking about uh, tax on unrealized gains. Essentially, your privacy is gone. That sounds like a tax headline. Essentially, it's a privacy headline. What is actually happening, people, is that the, the completion of a globalized slave state, unfortunately, is happening. Be a happy, if you accept you're a slave, be smart and plan to be a rich one, be a well-organized one, but um, you, have to, you have to swallow that black pill at some point. So to tax unrealized gains, they need to know what shares I own, what I paid for my house. They need to know, this is in America, but of course, all these things start somewhere and they roll out, just like UBI will start somewhere, but it rolls out. These are all coming. These, are, these thought processes, these outriders don't come out of nowhere. They are seeded by the power. They create quangos and they feed the idea, the Atlantic Committee, all of them. I mean, all social medias in, uh, banned Trump at one point or banned Alex Jones or whatever the case may be, all on the same day. They were called together by Kissinger. Um, so the point is, independent corporations don't all make a decision that echoes the other one on the same day at the same moment at the same time. This is control. You've got to see it as control. Otherwise, you don't want to see it as control. I'm okay if you don't want to see it because it makes you unhappy. I'm happy. I understand that this is naturally what would happen. I choose to have a very, very good life inside of that. But I'd rather know uh, absolute truth. Um, so answering your question on stable coins, they will own the KYC process so that they know you to a T where you are. I mean, the three big things coming. Central bank digital tokens, we've all agreed. Uh, passports. Uh, ID and passports of a biometric nature. So this is uh, going to have your irises. This is going to have your face geometry. This is absolutely everything. You've got elongated muskiness with these camera cars. There's also cameras facing you on the inside so that they can say, oh, but you were falling asleep. So that's why we slowed the car down. That's why they have a camera uh, on the inside. This technology literally will absolutely determine that it is you. It will absolutely determine geomet geologically where you are at a grid position at any any time. And when you spend money, um, it will absolutely know and update your broker account, your property. If you're adding value to your property, all of these things will be recurred. They all know they your entire also, assets. They can also reduce tax leakage by just taxing on every single transaction and sending it straight to them. Well, the Chiffin tax, well, uh, it wasn't the Chiffin, it was the, there's another name for it, where the tax transaction was deemed to be anti-economy, uh, anti so that'll kill activity. So it was largely, it was a British guy, his name, I've forgotten it, sorry, and I called it Chiffin, it, that's incorrect, and uh, it's, it skipped me. But the, the Tobin tax, I think it was, the Tobin tax, um, which is an activity based on transactions um, one. But what they will be doing is you will be paying real-time tax. And if, if I paid you back $5 because you bought me a, a Schmuckbucks coffee, um, uh, that you would probably have to prove that that's not an income. 
uh, and you would have real time 20% uh, um, you know, uh, tax taken off. I like to joke about uh, schmuck bucks because they, they don't like to pay too, too much tax, but they're all very, very uh, politically and woke. Um, I say sometimes uh, uh, it's a bit like uh, going to prison for sex, having a schmuck bucks uh, coffee. Uh, you know you're going to get it, but it's going to be rough. Um, but anyway, you won't get them as a sponsor on your program after that. But uh, certainly... They will, they, you will have real-time taxation. You're going to be taxed on gains you haven't realized. Just imagine this for a second. The, the high, if they mark to market tax, as they're going to call it, which sounds so fair because it's marking to the market. Imagine a 20K December mark to market Bitcoin 2017, 20K. Imagine what happened. I actually covered this in one of my Reset Sniper videos. You bought 10 Bitcoin for, uh, for uh, $1,000. It traded $1,000 that year. It went to 20K at the end of the year. You now have two hundred thousand dollars. They mark to market. They send you your tax uh, to pay on it. You only pay ten. You've made one hundred and ninety grand profit. Their capital gains is around thirty-seven point five. Their max in the UK, uh, the US. So call it forty percent for ease. They they want forty percent of your one hundred and ninety thousand. By the time the payment comes due, Bitcoin's collapsed to six k. Later that end of the year, it falls to three two. 3,200 at the low of the following year. Now you're due to have paid this tax, you've stalled, you've delayed everything. You will actually have to sell your 10 Bitcoin at 3,200, 32 grand to pay about 80 grand. You will owe them another $48,000 on your unrealized gain from the mark to market in December 17. And you'll be going in and waiting for the new mark to market. And they'll force you to pay it and they'll say, will give you a credit against future tax when it comes back up. You go into December, you're marking to market Bitcoin at four and a half. They say, okay, yeah, you've got a credit with us. But that credit only applies to Bitcoin. It can't be transferred to your capital gain on your house that went up and you owe them tax now on your house that was worth 200,000 uh, December 2017, but is now worth 250,000. So can you please give us the tax on your house? Sorry, you can't transfer it. It's not by asset class. So you've got a write-off against any future Bitcoin gain. I mean, you, you'll be taking out debt to pay your real-time tax bills. I mean, the it doesn't, whole concept, it doesn't paint a pretty picture. The whole concept of this this notion is absolutely, absolutely uh, vile. It's absolutely intrusive, and it's totally about privacy as much as it's about tax. Because to be able Thank to tax sure. people on gains, you have to know what they paid for every single thing that is deemed an asset that could be deemed to have appreciated. Uh, and you want to be levied. What do they do? Will they do cars if you have vintage cars and they go up? Who will value that? Well, I mean, this is just a hornet's nest that can't be opened, but it is intrusive. The whole narrative here is complete loss of personal privacy. And the, the banking system, the retail banking system may fade out and you're going to be ending up with a direct relationship, CBDC, everyone will have a direct account. Um, and it's, it's not a good development. It's not a good development. And I think the idea is to get us off ground. So if that's depressing people, what do you do? Accept that which you can't control. Because I'm understanding that my narrative isn't a very happy one. Accept that which you can't control. I was about control. to ask you, how do you prepare for this, uh, I guess, dire picture? Well, you've got, to, you've got to make it difficult for them and slow the process down as much as you can. Keep using cash if you can. Um, that, By the way, your bank statements and all of that, that's data reap that they use master visa, they all will be data reaping you, give them less data, get de-googled phones, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Lots of things. Seek privacy, even though you have nothing to hide, because you want to give them less information. Information absolutely is power. And you say, but I'm doing nothing wrong. They don't care. They will use it against you and they'll weaponize it. The less they know about you, the better you are. Buy land, have no bank debt on it, um, and expect wealth taxes. Um, and make sure you build wealth now during this period so that you can actually hang on to your property when those wealth taxes start coming um, because they will come thick and fast change jurisdictions which are particularly draconian places not to live are actually places that used to be good places to live not in america do not be an american citizen do not be a german citizen they're very well organized very efficient tax extractors they want to do the german system they want to take properties of landlords that don't have tenants in them they want to cap rents this is not hayek this is not price discovery. This is Bolshevik communism. 
In fact, we don't even have capitalism. They say capitalism has failed. We're destroying the planet. No, capitalism never failed. Capitalism never did that. There was a phrase for that, externalities. It shouldn't be allowed to happen. This is oligopolies of corporations that are bought, captured, and owned that have toxified our planet more than any individuals. Exxon was pumping uh, absolute waste into the Amazon River, poisoned entire tribes long ago. This, these people have been getting away with it for, for ages. The corporatocracy did that. That isn't capitalism. It isn't capitalism. Um, it's unguarded greed that uh, should have um, been captured, blocked, should have been broken up. Standard oil was never finished. It was just broken into pieces and the same owner became even richer. So we recognize the nation state that you are in and that these agendas have been universally advanced across all boundaries. Don't think in terms of countries. People want to pit Russia against China, against America, against China, against America. The warmongers will certainly want a bit of a conflict. They're going to heat up the China-America thing. I can see that coming into play. Islands in the Philippines. But that's just, that's just the two nation states doing some population control of male citizens uh, and spurging money on dark ops where they can then do spend more slush funds on high tech. This is, this is a crazy, unpleasant place at the moment. Build your wealth, get a community together and get, get rural, get away from urbanized areas, own it outright, know your neighbor, sponsor your local farmer, buy direct, push back, spend cash, buy gold and silver physical assets uh, because it's not tracked yet on a blockchain. I expect gold and silver to become illegal globally. Oh. I really do. It's too good a thing. Um, and that's not because it's performing well now. I'm saying own it physical. The physical price is higher. But uh, blockchain is not going to give you privacy. And I'm not even sure the best privacy coins will um, succeed against quantum computing or whatever tools they have. But they might help uh, from just everyday snooping. Um, but if you become a person of extreme interest, I think they'll break their way into anything. Um, and that's where we're at. It's a pretty dystopian world. Uh, support people that are pro-privacy, pro pro-freedom, uh, and will not give you, uh, force you into vaccine passports and all other biometric tracking, tagging data. You're becoming a tag prisoner in a, on this planet, and it's becoming hard to move. But there's amazing markets to trade, to build your wealth. Um, and live each day. I talk about, imagine I told you you're dead in three years. Do accelerated living. Go and do all those things. Bucket list knock. I'm traveling. I went to safari. I, I, I was 15 yards away from a one tusker elephant that eyed me up and almost gave me a clout. Uh, I'm, I'm riding motorbikes around the Sutu. I'm living. Live like, like there's no other, like there's no more than the three years. I've put the stopwatch yeah. on your life uh, right now. Be I true. wanted to ask you about these motivations, your freedoms, freedom of, freedom of location, freedom of association, freedom of that wealth that you build so that you can actually live life in your own terms. Those are the pillars, yeah. right? That's, that govern your life. That's right. We discuss the five freedoms and you must continue to exercise them and push back at uh, states. I do trivial little things that don't cooperate um, with this pandemic. That'll upset right. a lot of people that have bought fully mm. into it. Um, but uh, you've got to just make it difficult for them to enforce. Restaurant owners don't want to become policemen for the state. Uh, make it easy for them not to. If I have workers, I say you don't need to work masked up around me. Um, if, you, if you're clean, you're fine. It depends how in fear you are of, of what's around you. I don't choose to live in fear. Uh, I live really well and I don't choose to live in fear and I'm ready to make money out of this crazy, crazy Ponzi scheme. And I can see the tracks of what they're doing and where they're taking us. Yeah. Um, and it's a difficult message, but actually once you own a full, full truth, there's, you have a low expectation and you have plenty of room for upside. Do not have fantasies. I dispel absolute fantasies. Bitcoin is not liberty money. It's not, it's not secret. It's not uh, freedom money. They uh, were behind it and the control is creeping ever more in yeah. as they normalize it. If you want it to go up, it has to become part of the new system. If it's becoming part of the new system, tax extraction and KYC and privacy invasion is all part of that. Don't be foolish now. Don't be foolish. Don't buy into fantasies. Stamp that garbage out. Uh, trade what you see. Make a ton of money. Be super wealthy uh, and do reset prep and start uh, watching your privacy. Uh, and there's plenty of things, there's experts on that, but start with a de-Googled phone, stop using Facebook, 
um, unless it's for commercial yeah. use. Yeah. All before before you, you, you said that we cannot compare the 1940s to the present era just because it is very unique. It has a set of a completely very, uh, you know, uh, I guess, unique circumstances. And I wanted to, I guess, connect this uh, thought with uh, another in terms of the digital space. Uh, back in 2017, uh, a lot of uh, cryptos were kind of like, uh, you know, built a pie in the sky type of uh, trading and uh, promises, but there was no fundamental underpinning. Whereas now it looks like there is real use cases, there is uh, profit or in this case, uh, revenue generation. Uh, what do you think is going to be like this cycle? Do you think that we have a blow off top the, the likes we saw in 2017 or because institutions have come into the space, there's going to be a more sustainable uh, run within the cycle? Where, where you sit on that front? Yes, uh, I have some good images on my computer. So excuse me if I'm not looking direct in the camera, I'll try to pull some up to see if I can share that. Yep. But these images were, will illustrate very nicely why I say the following things that I'm going to say. Uh, and that is the, the cycle is extending in length for me. Right. The cycle mm -hmm. is extending in length. So I don't, everyone expecting, I've been saying for a long time, they're not going to get a December blow off uh, and then a crash straight away. I think you might have a smaller correction possibly before or just after december you might have a bigger one sort of march possibly but that it's we'll still go on and make a higher highs the way we're going up right now with on say like ethereum solana uh, and even bitcoin we see 84k we see a walk up but it's not a it's not runaway markets as yet so it's not mania even the sentiment 70 it's not 90 mm -hmm. um these are these are slower more moderated uh, moves up i think the big players the big difference is this institution now institutions mm -hmm. are getting involved the liquidity is higher each cycle is the same only different in some ways there's different players these players are not flash in the pan retail fomo up fomo down panic buy and panic sell um it's a different uh, it's a different quality of money that is moving in um, and as I say, I had some really cool diagrams. Here's one. I'll go back to the share screen. Yeah. This is actually doesn't belong to me. I actually um, borrowed it and I really like it. So credit to the original person. I've, uh, Does it mean that the market is going to be immune to the regulatory hammer that may come or that regulatory hammer and higher taxation and eventual removal or like regulating away stable coins is going to be delayed into 2023? And so forth. What's what's your take there? Or well, the market is going to be very strongly holding up for crypto to keep going up and to can to become the new horse mm. system. It absolutely will be regulated as per the old system, because the people that will not let you have your own money are the same people that will um, uh, want to control uh, what you do and to tax extract on you. So, you know, those, those, you're not getting, you're not escaping. You're not escaping all that goes with government. In fact, you're going to get a worse, more real time, faster, efficient version from a point of view of their use case. They're going to have a better tool um, and cash is going to be less and less used and everyone will get a wallet and all of this. This cycle here, I, I don't know if that answered your question, but uh, yeah, so unfortunately with price appreciation and more and more regulation, and it's creeping in all the time. I mean, you had this Gainsler is his name, um, who's essentially a New York Fed uh, guy that is saying, yeah, no, this must happen, that must happen. Who is he? I mean, if this was Satoshi's creation, who's not of any country, not of any land, why, why is he dictating what should happen with Bitcoin? But America is a big place um, and they'll use it as one of the big tentacles to rope it and rein it back in into the usual extraction system. This is cycles. The cycles are extending. This was the first cycle. I'll just draw uh, in red this time. That was the red. The red was the first cycle. This is from the low. So what are we looking at? That's from its low when it had a dip down to its cycle one high. That was July 10 to 11. This is half, This is also captures a little bit of the halvening, but it, it it highlights that it's no long. It's not a four year. Everyone thinks it's just going to be four year. This was cycle two. Um, that was June 2011 to 2013. 
This is uh, a log scale on the side here, by the way. Then the purple one is the one you will remember. Uh, most of most people that have come in since 17, that was the 20K high over there. So that's November 13 to 17. So you can see these time frames are actually lengthening quite a bit to these relative highs and it's going less high. So it's flattening and lengthening. Now, the interesting thing about uh, our technical analysis on our current set of circumstances is this orange uh, continue, this orange line is our current trajectory. There is that 20 high that dovetails with that. And that is the absolute low. So there's the low that was the $3,200 um, uh, around about the back end of 18, going into 19. This is our current trajectory. Now, this chart was done a while ago. I can point out that this orange line is now already retraced back up as we suggested it would and you are at a higher high here 64 and we're coming close now to 2022 so i should probably do it here we're at about 64 63 62,000 over here so we flattened a little bit here while last cycle you were in a blow off from june to december you went from three grand to 20 mm -hmm. 20 grand in that year so you can see that this cycle is also lengthening, but it will probably have some element of blow off. I just think the blow offs will be get slightly shorter as well. So if I just highlight previous blow offs, that was a monumental one. The first era one, very hard for me. I wasn't involved. That one was not bad. And then you had a, a longer to transpire one here. And I could have also maybe even drawn it all the way from there. So that these were super straight up almost. Uh, they a little bit smaller, a little bit flatter. So the guesstimation are for the high against the, the this is, okay, so where do we top out? Many people want to know. Well, we have a very good cot indicator. A commitment, it's called the Hunt Bitcoin uh, Commitment of Traders Indicator. And we basically compare the four biggest um, buyers versus the four biggest sellers and we do a differential between that and incidentally anyone watching this it's for free and it's available just go and search in your trading view hunt bitcoin cot and they're welcome to uh, download it there's a signal um, there's actually three components but you don't need it if you just want the signal but if you want to understand what we're doing i'll demonstrate it to you but that that's just before i take that chart away that's pointing to you know anywhere between um 130 to possibly even 250, 300s, mid 300s, if it goes roughly there. And I think it'll take longer. I think it's more likely because we've already taken longer. It's more likely to be a bit flatter and go longer because we're at about 64 now. You know, we could do something like that without it being super blow off. But don't forget, this is log scaled. We're still talking about something that's at 210,000 if you go up there. Um, so, Cycles are extending in length and they are flattening in growth. I think that's as close to proven as you can ever be. Um, obviously, things change. The one point we did make that was different a little bit about this is that this was a macro continuation technically. So we actually think this the, the overperformance here will be special. This is the Bitcoin chart, which I'll show you better on a Bitcoin chart, which I'll do next. Um, and I'll, while I also uh, tie the, co the commitment of traders, uh, our take on the commitment of traders report. So we essentially took the difference between the four largest buyers and sellers. Let me get a clean chart there and just remove all of that work and just add this indicator. So if the guys go there, they put in, um, it's in my favorites, but if they search and COT for commitment of traders. Whoops, let's do that again. Put Bitcoin in it. That'll help. There's the signal. Just click on the signal. Um, there's a few others when we were working in developments, but the, the signal is the one you want. Just click on the signal. We also explain it in more detail and we need to do a volatility uh, on top of that overlay, which will just uh, illustrate a very, very powerful tool. Uh, so since, since the futures were introduced, you actually get commitment of traders data. We didn't take it straight away because there wasn't much going on. So what I'm showing you is the Bitcoin chart. 
and this particular indicator. So it roughly settled down around about here in March of 19. So I'll just take off these legends. They're there, you read them to explain what we're doing. I'm gonna talk you through it. But essentially the red line on this indicator below, this red line is the four largest sellers. So that probably make up miners uh, predominantly. And the green line is the four largest buyers. Now, what we noticed is when you when those lines uh, spread up far apart, I'll just uh, see if I can make the blue chart, the blue one disappear for a bit. Just gonna make the blue one white so you can just see the red. What we noticed is that when, when you are very far apart, in other words, the, the sellers were more than the buyers generally, um, when you're very far apart, they're wide. There's a lot of sellers and the, the big four sellers are a lot smaller. It's usually a top. So over here, you'll see two short signals generated. That was the top. We actually called that top. Everyone was calling for all-time highs. The alts hadn't really moved very much. And there was shooting stars on the weekly charts. We said, this is a localized high. We're going to go into a big continuation pattern. People were getting too excited in June 19. Came back down. Pre the pandemic, Look at this massive difference between buyers and sellers here, a caution and then a super short call. You went from the better part of $11,000 to 3,900. That was an incredible short call. It's very hard to get shorts right on a macro chart on Bitcoin. This has two short signals, both correct on it. Um, and it actually called it twice into that high and it gave you a caution and a short. So we have a 10 out of 10 signal for an investor in crypto. This is the best signaling mechanism I could possibly think of. You don't even need to know HVF method. You can just go here. In other words, you super accumulate here. If you're just a blue pot investor, no leverage, you super accumulate, you disaccumulate. You accumulate, you disaccumulate, you reaccumulate. And this was a super long, that requires a volatility measure which I haven't shown you. It's an amplifier. It's part of our indicator. That means you must just be aggressively long. So if you maybe do 50% leverage and you just hold, this is very, very powerful. And just as a reminder, you, this is a two-day chart. Is that the sweet spot for you? Uh, when that's analyzing? correct. Two-day right. chart you're looking at. Thank you for uh, making me clarify that. It's a two-day, yeah. So we doubled up the two-day chart for that one. Mm -hmm. And then when we were in this falling wedge, we were one of the few guys bullish. People were calling 10K from here when we'd fallen 29 also, this head and shoulders, we, 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 we uh, called this head and shoulders as well um, and said 29,000 is your target. So you, if you don't wear the elevator down, you literally double your Bitcoin in these events. And it's yeah. not active trading. This is not screens. I have two screens on at the moment and I've got a closed MacBook next to me. Um, and I've just come back from holiday. It's not active day-to-day, uh, nine-minute, five-minute, half-an-hour stuff trading. You don't have to be in. Similar, similar type things that we've uh, said, for example, the predominance of ETH. We had, uh, this is very topical for guys that are in the crypto realm at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, ETH BTC as one of the examples over it, here. It looks like the, the targets for Ethereum US dollar might be even more ambitious than BTC US dollar. Since you said before that ETH BTC looks like it's going to uh, continue that bullish trajectory. Correct me Correct. if I'm wrong. Correct. We had a super long um, back in June, July. And then we, we on FBTC, we said to everybody, listen, guys, you need to be, uh, let me find a bigger history chart than this one. You need to be strongly long on this structure over here. We had an HVF set up over here. And that was when it was around the 2.5% level. So you wanted to be Ethereum dominant. Then if I put the annotations back on uh, over here, we called for this target and this top high that saw 8%. Ethereum went from 2.5% to 8% of a Bitcoin. You should rather have been in uh, Ethereum during that period. We identified uh, for everybody uh, that there was a macro inverted head and shoulders that I'll just show you with a fat blue here. This is all utilizing good non-dogma technical analysis, left shoulder, Big recovery to the same neckline of 4%, law of round numbers, 4% of a Bitcoin shoulder. Then the gas became a problem. It pulled back, double shouldered, just as it did here. You see, you mm -hmm. had a double shoulder there. Yeah. You actually had a double shoulder. It's a kind of cup and saucer, but then you dip down. 
She had a double shoulder. So this was a setup where we said, you're going to have a major reversal move that's going to take you through 7%. That was an aggressive thing to say when it was at 2.5% of a Bitcoin. And as a result, you've seen how things have gone. And then we've said uh, underperformance. And you've, you're going to underperform in F since that 8.3. What's happened? You've been in a macro continuation pattern right here. All pivoting around our previous target, sitting just above it. You can see the kind of like icebergs. They're sitting just above that legacy target there. And now we're in another continuation. I think we get a downward dip one more time, a little bit of an easing. That could be again on gas prices, lots of people tweeting about it. And then you go again. This target is through 10. That's why I start. I mentioned to you 10% um, of Bitcoin and we see Bitcoin going through 84K. We have structure for that too. So Ethereum is going to overperform. And I think others will overperform Ethereum. And we do the drill down on relative strength. We do a lot of cross crypto analysis and a lot of dominance analysis. And this is incredibly useful. That saw us get into Solano at the right time. It saw us get into Ada at the right time. That's now hopelessly underperforming. Um, and being able to, and this is not day-to-day uh, -day decisions. It's just once every uh Three weeks. Sometimes you do a a re uh, a re waiting. Being a good being a good sniper, you gotta yeah, stay true yeah. to your Observer, principles. Yeah, more observation and analysis, less trading. Do you use um, uh, on chain analytics in your decision making process at all? I think that they they, they are very very interesting. I, I mean, I look at stock to flows uh, chart. I um I I'll give look into Bitcoin a mention. They uh, send alerts uh, regularly to me. So I use them and I look at other people on Twitter uh, for that. But when it comes to price, if I'm not seeing it on the price chart, it's, uh, it's not happening. And uh, it, the relative strength analysis, just by being in the more of the right tokens. You know, we've had instances when we've been in the, the highest mover, first, third and fifth out of the top highest movers for weeks. You know, not just on the day. And that makes a whack of a difference to your overall uh, perf performance in terms of trading this. So it's a beautiful trading market. I've said some really hard things that some people are going to battle to cope with. They're going to get real resistance towards me. They might resent me for, but at the same time, beautiful trading markets, real truth. This is truth. This is one of the last vestiges of truth. I like to joke. I like my truth, like, uh, like my coffee, you know, sort of dressed in black and uh, bitter. Uh, because that's that's how truth truly is. It's not a fantasy story, but charts are truth. If 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 you, it's it's what they're doing. It's what they chase money. They have to own it. They have to buy it. Doesn't matter who they are. Their footprints need to be in the sand. People will often say to me, central banks were involved in that Euro Swiss trade. You know, the technicals can't matter. I get a lot of this. I absolutely saw exactly where they were involved. They're just like a big account. They're like a big retail account. That's all they were. I could see where they're holding it and I could see where they wouldn't hold it anymore because they were buying at logical levels. They were creating the volatility compression because people were wanting to sell and they were holding a level and it was getting so tight. Everything. They're all just participants in the market, um, whether they are government, a uh, small retail account, any, and the, the chart is your truth. Uh, and it's one of the few places that I still think I can find plenty of it. Um, but yeah. So, I mean, uh, yeah, Ethereum to overperform, we see 10% being taken out. This target alone is just under 10%. So, and as you could see with this target, it was a big turning. You had overperformance to that. You went to eight when we were looking for six and a half sevens. So it's a natural thing. You don't go up just to a single line. Um, you, you bypass. Yeah, and I know that you are rather bullish in uh, gold and silver. Obviously, that's going to be blending quite nicely with the narrative that you've been uh, portraying in this interview. Um, it looks to me like both metals have been churning around and uh, treading water. Do you think that that's kind of the accumulation period before we have the prime time for, for both assets? Yes. I, I mean, I'll just show you silver, which is the one I uh, trade the most because it's the higher beta uh, on gold, but gold mm -hmm. is the, the gold market. So you should look at that as well. But for me, this is a falling wedge. And I think we have that again in the red, the inverted head and shoulder here. Uh, ironically, you see, I've left the Bitcoin indicator on. Um, the, the reason why that's interesting is it also has a bit of a risk on risk off um, indicator. So when Bitcoin is super strong, it usually means the dollar is a little bit soft, 
and anti-fiat generally are doing well. So it's actually proven quite an interesting indicator for um, the, the other things like metals, uh, pet, pet, uh, energy and various other things. So, um, but this is an inverted head and shoulder. That's a neckline. It's working its way off. It's been a difficult time for metals holders because since the blow off here, and we did, we did have that bull run um, nailed. It was great. Let's go to gold first. Let's start with gold to do it in the right order. Um, it was truly great uh, move, but it, in relative to crypto, as many people go, it's almost boring. Um, but this was a big uh, structural call here. You had a falling wedge in there and you jumped in on the falling wedge and we had big, big targets for this. We actually had better against the pound and the euro. We had larger HVF setups that did perform um, as well. And since then, you've been in a progress decay period. You've been leaning on the 1670 level. But overall, we see them going up, but we see them being... The, the problem with the metals trades for me is that it's the, the control system doesn't want you in that. Um, and I think it's going to be the wrong trade. It's going to be hard to trade. Invest, yes. So I buy physical, but it's going to be the wrong trade for a long time until it's suddenly very much damn right trade. I think you could get crypto-like moves on it mm -hmm. later when eventually everything comes up and then it'll be banned. You won't be able to buy it or it, will be, uh, it won't be readily available. So there will, there will be a very short distance window when it starts to get disorderly that everybody wants, because this is actually a paper market. You don't buy for this price. You don't buy for this price at all. If you, if you want uh, silver delivered, I would take a lot of silver at $23, uh, 64. By the time it arrives, it's quite a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but that is the nature of, of the physical concept. So this is the best guess of what it should be. Uh, and when you look at scarcity, you only get about eight ounces of silver out for every gold ounce. We also call platinum, which had underperformed for a long, long time, uh, technically as well. So this has been a very, very powerful, uh, if you get macro chart, start on your monthly, big falling wedge, hopelessly underperforming palladium, but as rare, super, super rare, falling wedge, you've broken out of that, you had a smaller return move falling wedge, that's here, this is a monthly chart, so I drop back down to the daily, you can see this now smaller return move, and you've popped out of that one, so mm. this is all staircasing for higher highs, but is it going to be crypto melt-ups? No, but I think there will come a, a point when the dollar's going up and everything else is going up on it, the anti-fiat. And I think you will have a very short window to buy. And then it's black markets and illegal. Uh, but it, I truly feel that. Yeah. Whenever you draw all the lines in the chart and you identify the patterns that you're calling today and uh, you've been calling for the last 30 years, is there someone that has uh, you know, inspired you and that you should be most thankful for in terms of making the most difference in your own trading? So much of what I've done is self-derived, but right. in my earlier days, I got a lot of little bits from a lot of people. Right. So without anyone being super uh, dominant, I mean, Nissan on candles, I do practical candle charting almost every day, patterns, Getty's books, they're worthwhile having, um, you know, I, I, I didn't stop when I spent, I did point and figure course. Uh, uh, Jeremy Duplicy on point and figure. Anything that generates targets, I'm interesting, interested in from geometry. I think targets are undervalued in technical analysis, a takeoff point. So many people see profits wash in and watch them wash all out and eat a loss because they don't know when to take off. Not everything lasts forever. Um, targeting is such a crucial part and you don't have a risk reward. If uh, the, the whole principle of going back to ours, you know. Is the culmination, R's. the target is the culmination of your idea. Correct. And there has to be a takeoff point. And remember, we talk about a line of efficiency. If it just might go up or chop around, it's costing you for every moment. It's staying at the same level, but not going forward. So not that that should shake you out of a good trade, but you should have a concept of where it should get to. And this is feedback because often trade new forces come into play and it starts to lose its way. So if it starts, we have a time stop. If something breaks and has made good progress, but hasn't made the target, but then it runs its time stop, we close it. And most times I find very shortly afterwards, it sells off badly. It's very, very powerful that. Um, so the whole concept of RRR, so that means you don't make your target and you still make money and you don't stay on eternity paying um, a UK spread better or a, your broker or whomever unnecessarily long for holding a, a wilting trade that you've just become comfortable being married to and isn't even a real friend anymore. 
because it's not giving you anything. Um, and that's kind of a convenience relationship. It's just cull. You must, and you, but on what basis do you do that? How do you allow time? Well, if you haven't got geometry and you haven't got a methodology, which is what we do, and if people are interested, they can come to the marketsniper.com and book a call. Yes. They can find out how we do it. And we teach it, we learn it, we practice it, and we put our setups in there. So people practice in front of each other, we learn and we put the best ideas up. So you're not, it's not a trade idea fear. It's a learning environment. We've got mm -hmm. everything pre-recorded to excellent standard, good audio, and you can learn how to do this. This is a totally transferable skill. It's yeah. there, there's no one thing that is mind-blowingly calculus. Yeah. Do you tap into technology in any way, shape, or form for you to improve your decision making process, like uh, setting up lines with signals, or is it all purely manual from the very beginning till the end? So good, good, good analysis. It's good to systemize, and mm -hmm. uh, you could have algos to do. However, the nuances of uh, our um, idealized setups, because we look at proportionality, we look at um, structure. It's very, I find it very hard for code for. I'm sure yeah. right now there are people that have the power. Um, they're just not people I know that uh, could do very, very sophisticated things. We actually have a couple of family trees of possible pattern setups where one does something slightly different and it's a different family tree, but is highly effective and you don't want to eliminate it. But you can't apply the rule for one that you apply for all. Yeah. It's a bit like a sprinter, you know, Carl Lewis was quite leggy and tall, but Ben Johnson was short, bunchy and very muscly. You, you would have thrown out the guy who ran 9.79, admittedly with some steroids in his system, I expect. Uh, but if you just said, no, he's not tall enough. Um, so uh, I haven't conquered that is the, is the short answer in doing something that captures all aspects of what is a sprawling mind, which has seen many versions of price play and we, we self-analyze in the community but we know what we don't want and we know what we're looking for yeah. and it includes volume the value things in technical analysis is volume mm -hmm. because volume precedes big moves you want early remember the word with me is early be early close to your stop um, that allows you a uh, big size for a small loss um, you want volatility the pinch in the volatility is the gift that's the one part of bollinger bands that's useful no other aspect for me is provably practically trading, bouncing off bands. It's garbage for me. But I love him for what he did. You asked me about people that did useful. The pinch was useful, is, is, is the key value of a, having a Bollinger Band. If you don't know what an HVF is, you can start with Bollinger Bands. But remember, you have to keep changing that, moving. And, and just to side. make an analogy about your system, it's like whenever you are cooking popcorns and they, they just start popping, popping, popping to the point that volatility at some point is just going to be exploding, right? Like a pressure cooker. So it's just going to... Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And, and that's what gives you much larger moves to the upside exactly. uh, than a very limited risk. Because if you've got the direction right, and the key thing is by not having a market order and having a tripwire order, you only get put in at the last possible moment. And if I already have the, the order on the broker's system, yet you still have to mm. type it in on yours, who gets filled and who ends up chasing and gets terrible liquidity and then says his broker raped him? Look, I'm not going to tell you broker's good, broker's bad. You are needing brokers and they enable your activity. So many people complain about brokers and it's their trading that did it. Did you have your order in the system before? Mm. If not, you're chasing out of the cinema when 500 other people are all trying to get out through the same door. And then, you, then you're blaming the cinema company mm. because you got a bit crushed when you got and stamped through the door. Well, Merry Christmas. Time to own your own outcomes. Yeah, you got everything well thought out and planned. And talking about plans, what is it that you're looking forward to the most into 2022 inside and outside of the, the trading arena, if I may ask? I think the trading arena in this reset environment is going to be unbelievable. It's going to be one of the few gifts of what is a reducing freedom and privacy. Right. Um, I'm super excited about a lot of trades uh, and we've got them in our community in great detail, some of which we mentioned here. FX, uh, I've got four equity trades I'm going to be talking about in my uh, live trading day that are macro ones that are going to be huge R moves as well for very liquid stocks. Um, I'll mention uh, one of them. I think you'll like uh, Overstock. That was one I mentioned it because there was a guy, there was a guest who appeared on Real Vision who was really dedicated. Can't remember his name, and he's fundamentally analyzed this thing to kingdom come for years. His day is finally coming. He's going to get a 169 run, but he sat with that stock and it's gone up and it's gone down. Beautiful structure, macro setup, 
he's finally going to get his reward. But as a fundamental analyst, he's had to wait for something I think is now coming um, for him, which will be great. While we've flipped our money over many, many times, because you've got to get the, the, the timing right, as well as the mathematics and the fundamental analysis. Yeah. And that's why fundamentalists, in terms of their analysis, truly need HVF method. Absolutely. Yeah. What about uh, the on site, the, the trading arena? Uh, keep uh, uh, touring around with your bike, uh, visiting countries? Oh, yeah, outside the world. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, I'll just show you that because I've given your guys uh, a tip yeah. and they might want to see that chart. I'll just sure. put it up quickly uh, as a courtesy and then I'll tell you uh, about that. Mm -hmm. This is the overstock uh, one. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's already now it's already begun moving. We were in it. We had call options throughout. Uh, I was a bit early, if I'm honest. Uh, and I've been sitting through a bit of churn now. Sometimes that happens if you want to be, but that's a uh, 160 that we see. It's still only 101 now, but you could have been in at 75. You could have been in uh, even over here. We were already sniffing around it in the low 70s. So that's quite a nice, interesting move. There's others that are really interesting. One was a retro tech company that's all but forgotten that goes around devices that is somebody's going to be injecting something really interesting in there. And I just can't wait for the headline. Because actually, we all love stories. We love stories about people and stuff. But the interesting thing is I get to do the trade first, and then I hear the story. Why will that go to do well? So come and find out about those. You can follow our What about the, in, in this chart, when, it, when uh, it comes to risk mitigation, what is your uh, approach to reduce risk when a trade starts going in your favor? Uh, we stand on our stops. Right. So we've had instances where you could you could have an incident. It, uh, it's not highly probable over here, but if I were to just draw on this example, so overstock's gone from uh, you know seventy six, let's say, up to one hundred and one. Mm -hmm. You could have an incident where it bounces back. The market has a the whole stock market has a bed wet. It bounces back and does this for a bit, and then it starts basing up, and then it goes and does your target. Crazy things happen in markets. And you close there. If you drag that stop, which is under the red line, that was your last allowable entry. We call it the just in time. We take early entries as well. So we teach you the methodology. You need you needed the tools for entries, how you implement them. If you do an improvised stop, say somebody was doing a late entry. So let me help your audience looking at a trade. How can they do it? This is something practical. I've had to listen to a lot of me. How could they practically um, get into this trade? Well, unfortunately, it's now moved quite strongly. Quite it's taken out the first interim, but the next major interim revel where we expect it to rest is quite a long way away. It's 135. Can we do a, can we force an entry in here? So what you might do is you might have to take a higher risk. You might have to say, well, listen, uh, I'm prepared to take a higher risk. The HVF will succeed if it makes that target before it runs that red line, but it could succeed, but come all the way back down to what we call a just-in-time level. You could get a second chance. But normally when you get such a big break, remember, earnings. You see how I leave the earnings tag on there? Mm -hmm. That's earnings derived. So they overperformed on that. So, okay, you had a bit of an earnings event. We'll have a little bit of an analysis on this. This is maybe a difficult one because it's just broken, so it hasn't done too much since then. A little bit of a broadening structure on top of this bull pole. Let's expect it to come down maybe a little bit. So put a buy limit order. You could organize a possibility at 92. And you put a stop under there. If you can eat that amount of risk, just adjust your sizing. So that's your $100, your $1,000, whatever you're prepared to spend on the trade. Then you can still have a reasonable risk reward trade. Um, to 160 that would be your gain i actually think it will surpass that we might do a partial close by the way so there's overperformance on that i mean we, we we explain what circumstances there's overperformance are possible but if we do that you still got a 4.72 i'd put that as a you could creep forward now recognize the hvf hasn't failed if you get stopped out the hvf only fails if this red line is run mm -hmm. so there is a possibility it could do a really colorful route but generally yeah. this doesn't happen often Got it. it doesn't happen often. So there's a 4.72. And I would, as I say, I'd do a 60 or 70% close and I would overperformance manage. We have an exit strategy and criteria that works, but you can just hold for a little bit longer and uh, trade uh, until you know how to do that. Um, it's something for our premium guys. But that's how you could break an enter in there.
uh, for that trade. Um, your other, so, yeah. the other question was travel. I think I'm going to be traveling a little bit again. Um, I get, I got a bit ill, funny enough, after this travel. I don't like these PCR tests personally. I don't know what goes on. I get headaches, right. um, but it might just be irritation in your nose, know, throat. You can speculate. I don't know, uh, but yeah. Uh, I love seeing um, new countries. So we might go Latin America a little bit. Uh, maybe do some, work is fun for me. So I actually work from different locations. That's like a holiday. I just go somewhere else and end up doing the same thing. But I also like riding um, some motorcycles, as you pointed out. We, re we went around the Sutu. It was great to be in Africa. We did a bit of safari there. Um, just enjoy the good things, you know, yeah. fly business if you can afford it or fly private if you can afford it every now and then. Um, make the money so that you can enjoy making the money, um, help those around you. So I've got friends that are in South Africa. I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to cajole them, get them in crypto, I sort of help them out a little bit. Yeah. Um, gave some, some crypto. Do you, tokens. do you know, uh, Chris Laurie trader, Chris Laurie? I've heard of the name. Forgive right. me he, if I don't. Yeah. Well, Chris Laurie is a Canadian trader and, um, uh, the way he spends his life, uh, aside from trading, he's an undercover operative and he takes uh, uh, big trips uh, to Thailand, to the Philippines, and uh, she rescues girls out of the sex trade. And that's something that really fulfills him outside of trading. So that's also the reason why I wanted to ask you, because there's something else that's got to fuel fuel you. And in your, in your case, I believe that uh, freedom and that curiosity to actually explore the world is something big. And if you can combine it with teaching, with uh, trading yourself, I think that is incredible. I just watched a video of you with Andrew. Andrew is someone who bought Bitcoin in 2017, forgot about it. And then it went, what is it? 20, uh, 20, yeah. percent. I mean, that's made a material change to his life because he went through a divorce. Um, right. and he was so glad he listened and he was really grateful. Funny thing is I hadn't seen him in three years and I, I barely didn't recognize him. And he was like, Hey, you know, yeah. oh, you did this. he was so glad. Because so it must be very helpful. gratifying for you as well, yeah. you know, because these are people that listen what you got to say. He obviously, yeah. he even, I mean, he forgot about it, which I guess it was a great thing in hindsight yeah. because uh, it went, that. yeah, yeah. But, uh, I told him it, to forget about it again. <laughs> yeah. So what's your? I was about to ask you, what's your advice now? Shall, shall he forget again? Uh, I, I no. I think it's going to be hard for him to forget because it's become material to his <laughs> exactly. uh, financial One million wealth. South African but, rands he mentioned there. So yes, no. but I mean, it's just if you could put dollars in front of there. I um, mean, it's, it's obviously less money to find, um, and it's less money that he's made than in yes. dollars. But. Uh, you know, I know there was a good guy going through a divorce. He was, he was the medical, uh, the medic who was very good. Actually, we needed right. him in the end. He held a guy, he helped a guy, a rider had a bad fall in the last day. Um, and yeah, it was just nice. And he was just truly grateful and he was ready. You know, he just wants to do more. Uh, and I just want to keep him in the game. Yeah, I think if you awesome. stay in the game, sometimes you don't have to shine. You just have to still be there. I mean, I became an officer in the army and I was one of the worst soldiers. I was naturally untidy. The only thing was I was physically fit and you could chase me around till kingdom come and I was mentally strong and I kept showing up. I saw much better guys, tougher, neater, smarter, rifle was always clean, better and more disciplined for falling in line and all of that. I was too, you know, thinking my own thoughts uh, and cutting my own path. Um, fall by the wayside just because they couldn't keep showing up and eventually they had enough. They didn't have the fortitude. This is a test. View this as a game. View life as a game and none of this is so scary. You know, if you need some magic mushrooms, find some and take them. Learn to relax. View this as a game. You're having an experience. Life is an experience. You don't get to dictate what other people are doing around you. You're getting a certain narrative, a story that is building around you. Be honest with yourself about what that story is. Treat it as an arcade game. You're having an experience and your life will end. Come be, get used to that. I cried when I first heard my mom was going to die as a baby when I was three or four years old and that I myself would die. And that was it. I mourned the fact that we're not immortal and I got over it. And actually, it's no bad thing. Um, it's possibly a gift. So, be be awesome be honest you're getting one shift try try be as straight and as uh, fair with everybody you deal with um you know give people the benefit of the doubt most things are not personal uh, and go and enjoy the game and touch and help people up around you there you go and and by building wealth you can further facilitate i mean that guy you just mentioned i have all the respect in the world for him he's a gent i must go look up his name he was give me his name uh, what yeah. a guy yeah, I, mean, I will the, and, and can I say, I've taken, I don't want to bring this topic into your interview at all, but I've taken deep dives on what goes on 
around children yeah. and uh, the, the trafficking side of things. Yeah. It's, 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 it, it kills me. Those yeah. people never had a chance in life from very, very young. We are yeah. extremely fortunate. You're extremely fortunate yeah. and you're lucky. Remember that. The fact that there might be a control structure that wants less of you around on the planet, yeah. whether that's true or not, doesn't matter. It's a thought. It's an idea. Go and live like it's your last three years. And if you do a good job of it and you're touching enough people, you may get another three years. Yeah. Treat life as a lease that gets renewed yeah. rather than something you're entitled to that only ends some point in the mid 80s or 90s. Yeah. And, and suddenly you wake yeah. up and you start doing things. Things need done today. I live an accelerated life. I'm very lucky. I have good quality people that want to help. All my staff are people that actually worked in our, that were clients first as community members. Can you believe that? I mean, I don't, I don't hire external people. And most of them, are, they're all vaccinated. They all get, they have free work with me. They're happy to work. They work here. We have people in Panama. Um, so, you know, just if you're consistent, uh, if you're clear, and if you're honest and you're trying to find truth, um, people respect the straightforwardness of that. Yeah. Deception, it's, devious, yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's not a path. Yeah, it's funny because uh, at Gold Prime, the uh, the brokerage that I'm part of and uh, Jeremy co-founded, uh, our employees, the, the the vast majority, they are people that used to work, uh, sorry, they used to be clients and they become uh, employees of the company. Jeremy, it's a very you, good sign for your business there. Exactly. I'm impressed. Yeah, you wanna, it's a very you wanna, good sign. I'm impressed by that. What's the uh, percentage? Conception. What's the percentage of uh, employees we got that used to be clients, Jeremy? Um. I think those guys are really coming in and girls uh, are coming in from the Discord server that we run. So we actually yeah. hang out with our clients. Uh, we do calls with them quite often. And yeah, it's all about community and getting to know each other. But yeah, they're, more, they're mainly coming on the retail support. So yeah, percentage isn't like super high. There's, um, you know, there's quite a few people now. But, but yeah, it's great you know, to bring someone in that understands uh, trading because they are a trader. So they can hit the ground running. Uh, they know how they want to be spoken to when they're looking after other clients. And yeah, they just become part of the furniture and part of the family. So we love it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Good. Uh, I wanted I, to I, ask I, you, Francis. Yeah. Sorry, I, was, I spoke over you. You wanted to mention something no else? No problem. No, I just I wanted to ask you. I'm a little bit, but uh, carry on. Okay. So if there was someone out there that you would recommend me to follow up with an interview because you haven't seen much content of him and because, or because he's a hero of yours, he's an idol. Uh, would there be someone that comes to, comes to your mind? Like, I wish uh, Ivan were to, you know, get hold of this person. So I would love to hear more about him. And I got to say that Chris Laurie, someone I mentioned that does all the uh, sex trafficking work as well on the sidelines, he is the last that I interviewed. So maybe you have someone else in mind. I'll be yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I must, Chris Laurie, you must, is it L-A-U-R-I-E? I must check him out. I really yeah. must. Um, so uh, I like people that are, unfortunately, this sounds, uh, this might sound wrong, but I like people who I can, I don't have heroes. I think I, I don't, I don't fan, have fantasy. So yeah. I don't, <laughs> I don't put people too high on pedestals. It sets them up to fail. Um, so I, I, Demartini is actually one of my, um, the people that I use for templates that I have mentioned that I do tweet out a little bit. And I think the, the framing of values and uh, how you shouldn't set people up to fail and don't create hero. Most of the people you met, I mean, Warren Buffett, for example, I, I, I don't, uh, I used to think, oh, I'd like to be a Warren Buffett when I was younger and all of this great. Uh, I've learned enough to now see him just as another man, but has done certain things well, but his opinions on other things I, I don't I don't wear well. Um, so I see pe people as shades as gray rather than absolute whites and blacks. Um, but I would say the one person I wouldn't mind speaking to uh, was Eric Weinstein, I think, um, because he seems to be asking tough questions. Um, I, he's not actually a, so much trader, though. He's more, uh, I'm not sure if that's appropriate for you, because as a brokerage, you might mm -hmm. want, but his truth about, I mean, he was all over the Epstein case. And as someone, right. um, uh, you know, who's clearly Jewish, uh, he was asking the tough questions and not brushing it under the table. And I respect that as yeah. a truth seeker. I'd like to see more. I'd like to know more about what he thinks about certain prevalences uh, of the New York and the Hollywood set in that whole racket. We are essentially in a, a, a blackmail political run scam that seems to 
involve dark states. So, you know, you, you are, the presidents are selected, not elected. I don't want to go whole black pill again. But um, so he's interesting. From a trading perspective, um, there's some value to Elliot Titians. You know, there's three wave sellings with two rallies. There's value to Elliot, but there's, I've seen some guys make crazy predictions that have never come uh, around a lot of the time. But uh, there are some good operators there as well. So if you're talking about uh, uh, that, the others are mainly, uh, actually, I prefer our technical analysis over everything else. That sounds a bit self-aggrandizing. I apologize for that. Uh, and sometimes we get a plenty wrong. Let me just quickly add, um, we get plenty wrong. Um, but I do, uh, I do still like looking at other people's uh, charting. I'm trying to think. Who else? Uh, I think Brent Johnson's interesting because of the dollar work that he's done. Yeah. Um, dollar milkshake, and, milkshake, right? I think yeah, the is. milkshake. I think that's uh, interesting how things fail. It fails on success. And it, and he makes it clear. It's not a moral thing. It's not right. because the dollar's good. It's because of how the system's been designed uh, because of the the privilege of one the, the 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 world currency it wasn't it's not going to be like the pound which kind of whittled down and america slowly took the mantle off it there isn't really one everyone thinks china's the one no there isn't one nation we're not going to another nation state uh uh currency this is that there, there is this is why i say don't compare this period in history with any other before we people tend to think associatively that has to be and it's like that uh, the mm -hmm. amount of times i heard you know we're going to do deflation like Japan. And I said, no, 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 nothing like Japan. The Japanese save, um, they're aging. Um, there was a whole, anyway, you know, there was a lot. So people make a lot, they'll get a couple of things right and then they'll just associate, they lump it from one thing to another. Don't, don't go around clinging to trees. Sometimes it's got a little bit of that and a little bit of that and it's, it's unique. It rhymes, but it's not exactly the same. So in terms of people to ask, uh, he might be interesting, Eric Weinstein, and then uh, I just want to know best follows. You've already, I assume you might, you've spoken to Raul. Uh, Raul doesn't deal with, for me, the secrecy invasion and the privacy invasion of crypto and the fact that it's captured. I don't think he and I would agree on that. Mm. Um, but it'll be fascinating for you, bo both of you to have a conversation. Is there any plans ahead for you to to talk about? Uh, I'm not space? sure. They put me on for my technical. They're right. big, big organizations. So I do what they tell me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They've definitely grown. I'm glad to appear there. Uh, they've done a great job. I yeah. think that as a businessman, he's done a great job. I think as uh, a commentator, he speaks a lot of sense on a lot of things. Uh, and he's right about the exponential um, aspect of this. We are having to accelerate up. I, I often use the phrase, the beach ball in the corner it has got to become the Jupiter of the old legacy financial system. So the inflation and the scope is unique for wealth building. Um, but that's why I think also most of us are going to get taxed to the daylights. Everyone needs tax structures. Truly, yeah. they do. It's just something we do for our community. And that's not a sale. If you utilize us or you go somewhere else, good luck to you. You know, uh, but I do what I, uh, I help others do what I've done for myself because I, and, and even still the laws can change. It's not an insurance policy that's perfect, you know, uh, but I try to do something. Um, but so, yeah, I think he's, he's, he's good on the blue sky elements. I, I, I tend to like to see the shadow as well as the form, um, because you see what he's holding behind his back. <laughs> when yep. you see his, the, uh, the, Raul the Pal's got this video called The Exponential Age that went viral on YouTube. I think it's got more than 1 million yeah. views, just like one of your videos that's got like 1.5 million views or something. So each one of you, very eloquent communicators, and that's the hardest part. Unpack everything and uh, put it out there, lay it all out, and you do have your cases. And one of the things that I noticed main takeaway, or one of the main takeaways is that by you calling yourself a time cynic or someone who is thinking outside of the box, that actually portrays to me someone who has uh, grown out of the system in terms of having independent thinking. And that's what really traveling gives you as well. You know, like you find yourself in different circumstances. That's why I also want to promote to like my own children and stuff. Like they do go out there and they find themselves facing circumstances that are going to take them out of their comfort zone. And that's why trading is so relatable, right? Because you find yourself discovering Inner, inner discoveries that you would not be faced, or at least you can really turbocharge those experiences by trading as well, by traveling. So yeah, one of the great takeaways. So whenever you call yourself a cynic, I think that that's a good thing, you know, like uh, you are not a follower, you are someone who wants to put out there what he considers to be the truth. 
I'll actually, uh, I'll sign off on um, a little bit of an addendum to that. Um, they talk about uh, alpha males. I'm absolutely not an alpha male. Uh, alpha male dominate or seek to dominate and have a lot of beaters that carry around. They do this in sort of wolf packs. They identify these people uh, because part of the journey I mentioned of this training and just implementing HVF method is a journey of self-discovery. And I'm most certainly a sigma and it's a lesser known one. And sigma is I resent people who dominate others. I actively resent it and, I, uh, and I'm largely alphas treat me with uh, suspicions. And, and it's, uh, the sigma is known as the lone wolf he'll walk his own path entirely, yeah. um, but can be a leader of many, but then in a non-dominant way, the freedom of association. So you're here because you want to be. I've always wanted to be, have people around me that are here because they want to be here and that when they want to go, they're absolutely free to go. Uh, and they're doing the activity that they're free and want to be doing. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, those are principles of mine. I'm not uh, any form of uh, dominance. I don't like uh, anyone dominating or stripping away. So yeah. um, that's that's Sigma um, rather than uh, everyone wants to be an alpha. I don't think it's the thing you should be wanting to be personally. Uh, and I kind of morphed that. And then I later found out the description. I, be, I was behaving that way, and then mm -hmm. I found out. That's oh, there's a name for it. So yeah, it's worth checking out as a as a personal development thing. Have a look at uh, the Sigma man, and also the Sigma woman. By the way, of course, it's for everyone. Um, and I think it's the greatest. It's the greatest uh, person uh, archetype to build community around of freedom seekers. It's the community libertarian freedom seekers that seek not to be dominated, would seek to be around. Um, and uh, that's what I've tried to do because I'm that person and I wanted to create something that I felt comfortable. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Phenomenal. Thanks very much for having me on. Yeah, it's been uh, two hours plus. So there's definitely been a lot that we've unpacked. Uh, Jeremy is back, even though it looks like uh, by now he's about to hit the sack, right, Jeremy? Midnight, <laughs> midnight in Australia. <laughs> uh, you're muted, you're muted, Jeremy, you're muted. I was just saying that it's midnight over here, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that, but I really enjoyed that chat, but it was very insightful, and yeah, I hope the audience enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Yeah, good luck yeah. and keep growing the business. Seems like you're on a great path. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francis. We appreciate it. I'll send, you, I'll, send, I'll send you the, the video once it's uh, been edited uh, to Alex, in this case, and uh, you'll have it ready if you want to revisit. Uh, by the way, just out of curiosity, um, I don't know when you would plan to uh, release, but if you wanted to put, say, your um, your broker name, I don't know how you are with content, what's your, your, your plan, but if you would like us to share after, say, a month or three weeks once you've debuted this on our channel, we're quite happy to also serial cut it. It's quite lengthy, so I'd make, maybe break it into half-hour pieces. Yeah. And also serialize it there and um you know if you have a website that you put on your copy on that if people want to engage i'm sure we could let that slip in um if you if you wanted to have that and, and you permission us to host the content as well um you're welcome uh, we're quite happy we enjoy putting regular things out so i appear on other people's sites i sometimes interview people but i, I where other people are happy i will quite take the content later so you get the you debut it and all the initial hype and then later on we can put it on if you like if that's something you would like yeah with open arms yeah great so when you're ready three weeks after or whatever once you've got the surge of views uh send me the file on dropbox or something um and we'll we'll serialize and put it out and get you guys uh known to our community as well perfect really thank you great sounds great good night there uh all the best ivan nice talking to you likewise thank you francis bye -bye. thanks guys i appreciate it yes. thanks jeremy bye bye thanks everybody have a good one